Hi guys, so a little bit of a disclaimer before we kick into this week's episode. We recorded this and literally as we finished recording this two-hour podcast, the Sasha Banks news broke. Um, So just so you know, um, we will be covering that next week, but we didn't want to re-record the podcast having, like I say, talked for nearly two hours or over two hours about everything that went on with tag league and the announcements about dream queendom so we will talk about sasha banks and her apparently imminent arrival at wrestle kingdom 17 next week Uh, until then please enjoy the show hey this is kevin kelly and you are listening to the stardom cast guys, and welcome to the Stardom Cast, your weekly audio source of all things World Wonder Ring Stardom. I'm your host, Rob Gooden, and I'm joined as ever by Matt Turner. Matt, how are you, good, good sir. sir? I am fantastic, sir. Always good to talk to you. I'm glad that you're back in the saddle again as we have the dynamic duo, me and you, back together for this week for a absolutely loaded show as we talk about the finals of this fantastic tournament. Yeah, we have got a, well, a ridiculous amount to talk about because not only have we got night ten, 9 and 10 of the Goddess of Stardom Tag League and, of course, the final itself, uh, we've also had official cards released for Dream Queendom at Sumo Hall on the 29th. We've had cards announced for Year End Climax and the New Blood Show in uh, Sinjuko Sumitomo Hall on the 16th as well. So we've got loads and loads and loads to talk about. But first, Matt, before we talk about any of that, how nice is it that we can still talk because the USA didn't beat England in the World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, obviously Rob wasn't here. This is this is a two-week uh, ongoing conversation. So <laughs> Rob wasn't here. Rob wasn't here last week. As everybody knows, he had a job tryout. Uh, to try out to try out for um, the backup dancer and singer for Meltier, as we uh, as I stated last week, as I stated last week. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, so just to give you an idea of this text conversation between me and Rob. Now, obviously, Rob is a giant football slash soccer fan, huge, huge, passionate fan, and I appreciate that your passion, sir. Me, on the other hand, I have seen two soccer games in my entire life. My nephews. Right. So not my, and I don't get me wrong. I appreciate the athleticism, any sport anybody plays. I appreciate the cardio and the hand and the coordination with trying to kick a ball. If that was me, I'd fall flat on my face. So, so we all can pretty much uh, agree that I'm a pretty positive, easy going person. Right. So I'm sitting there on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving night, and uh, I'm having some fantastic food with my family. And I'm getting ready to have not one, not two, not three, but four pieces of pie so i I have four desserts anywho (laughs) and i'm sitting there watching american football and all of a sudden a commercial comes on saying tomorrow at 2 p.m eastern time world cup game the united states which is my country versus england which is rob's country so i pick up my phone and i text my very good friend and co-host of this podcast rob goodwin and just have a nice polite again hey it's thanksgiving i'm me i'm in just a phenomenal mood i'm all around family getting ready to have a beer with my old man just oh i'm just in i'm in a i'm in a more positive mood than normal pick up the phone just to text him that hey we're gonna have this game you know my country versus your country and all of a sudden <laughs> i get this litany of text messages basically rob is gonna quit the podcast and never talk to me again if the united states beat england in the world <laughs> cup game first of all I'm just trying to be polite and say hello and hey, best of <laughs> luck to you, sir. Best of luck to you, sir. So, you know, on this, this uh, American holiday that we're having, and I'm like, oh, boy, you know, I, this, this podcast might be over with over something mean you have no control over. It. And that's the point I'm trying to say, folks. Professional sports you have no control over. Like, to give you an example, my dad grew up. Uh, right outside Pittsburgh in the 70s. If anybody knows anything about that, the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 70s were the biggest thing in sports, right? So my dad watching this, and my dad's a bigger a bigger guy, right? He was very intense growing up as a kid. <laughs> so 
when we watched the Steeler games, my dad would flip out to the point. Again, you have no control over what happens, folks. He would throw his shoes. He would whip his sneakers at the TV <laughs> to a point where my mom was smart enough. because She's like, we're not, we can't afford another TV if he breaks it. So when my dad was sitting down watching the game, she would go behind him and remove his shoes with slippers. So <laughs> <laughs> anywho, uh, so obviously what had happened was I did not, well, I only watched like the last 10 minutes of the game just to see where it was. And I think I even text Rob as the game was starting. And I was like, Hey, good luck to you today. I'm really excited. For we, that was the day before our interview with Karen Peterson. I was like, Hey man, I'm really excited for our interview tomorrow. With Karen Peterson. And I think you said something along the lines of, <laughs> Yeah, well, if we lose, you're going to do the interview on my on by your own because I'm done. I was like, oh. So I watched the last 10 minutes. I'm like, well, I don't want the podcast to be over with, but I'm kind of rooting for the U.S. because I live in the U.S. So it's like, what do I do here? The best possible outcome happened because the U.S. didn't lose and you didn't lose either. It went to the Rossi Ogawa special time limit draw <laughs> at zero <laughs> versus zero. So I waited for it to be over with about 10 minutes because I was like, I don't know if he's flipping chairs or I know some of my friends, they watch the games on delay so they can fast forward the commercials. So I go, bo- so about 10, 15 minutes went by and I text Rob and I said, hey, buddy, that was, uh, should have known that was going to happen. Two guys that own a, that run a stardom podcast that they love to do time limit draws. You figured that would be the finish. <laughs> and I think you said something, but yeah, at least in stardom, we get more false finishes. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, at least there's some manner of closing stretch to start. Honestly, it was... I don't know how many, I don't know what the Venn diagram is in terms of uh, soccer fans and stardom fans that listen to this podcast, but uh, yeah, it was possibly the most boring game I've ever seen in my entire life. Like there was very few chances. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan, but I support a team called Newcastle United who up until this year, um, we were perpetual losers. So I'm used to, you know, misery, in my sports. Um, but yeah, we got bought out by contentious owners. Let's leave it to that. Um, and now we have money and we win things. And it's, it's, it's a novel thing to happen because our family is so, so, um, contr- so like programmed to just wait for the highlights and go, Oh, bloody hell, we're crap. Oh, can't believe we're doing this. And now we're winning. And it's sort of, we won that for England as well, but England are still quite rubbish. And the fact that it's a winter world cup and it's, you know, minus six at the moment in england so it's bloody cold which means that every brit is slightly more dour than they are normally because we are generally quite miserable people in britain um but the cold well, doesn't help well buddy i just want to let you know if your team loses you said it was france this weekend you guys are playing we have got france in the quarterfinals yes well if you do lose i just want you to remember that you have me and you have all the friends and family <laughs> of the stardom cast buddy how about that there's a little Little pillow for you, my friend. Little warm blanket. And I fully ap- chicken soup for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> and I fully appreciate it, unless any of our listeners are French. <laughs> of course, I don't mean that. Of course, I don't mean that. Oh, jeez. Fu- <laughs> fully expect France to win. <laughs> France are a much better team. Anyway, <laughs> enough talking about soccer, which I guarantee nobody apart from me cares about. Matt, take us through what is going on in our merry Mayu Christmas over on the Patreon. All right, let me take a deep breath because all right, there's a <laughs> lot going on, folks. First of all, the uh, Patreon subscribers have uptick quite a bit since the 1st of December. And as we're recording this, we're only one week into the first month. So first of all, thank you and welcome to all of our new listeners. And uh, because of that, and because of the fact that it's Christmas, and because of the fact that um, I need another reason to watch more Mayu matches, I'm adding on a couple of a bonus episodes for Merry Mayu Qu- Christmas, Mr. Rob Goodwin. Uh, first and foremost, I mentioned last week, because the 2016 Cinderella tournament that Mayu won, which was voted on by our fantastic listeners of the podcast, uh, since that is only three matches, I just feel absolutely terrible by doing a show for only three matches. So what we're going to do is... Your first bonus episode for the white belt and red belt tier Patreon members is going to be the, obviously the 2016 Cinderella tournament. And then on that very same day, you're also going to be getting a bonus episode, which will be Mayu and Saki Kashima's goddess of stardom title rank. 
So uh, there's five matches all there. So it's, I'm going to, I'm going to separate up in two, two different things. So it's going to be like basically two mini episodes. You have the 2016 Cinderella tournament, which obviously Mayu wins. And then uh, the five matches between with Mayu and Saki Kashima's uh, one, uh, goddess of stardom championship run. Those will probably be released if not on the same day, pretty much within 24 hours of each other. So there'll be two smaller episodes and then, of course, at the end of the month is going to be uh, the big one, the one that I'm so looking forward to. It's, that'll be Mayu and Io Shirai, Thunder Rock Review. And I'm probably gonna, just going to be picking anywhere between 8 to 10 random matches. And I'm obviously going to do them in order and uh, just basically just kind of just going through the fantastic run that is Thunder Rock. Now, for the Red Belt tier Patreon members, you're also getting bonus episodes as well. But before we get into that, I just have to apologize because the first watch along that we just re- released on Monday, which was Mayu versus EO uh, from the 2015 Five Star Grand Prix, it is not on Stardom World. And I thought I've, I thought I saw, and that was my mistake. I have this match on so many DVD compilations, Rob, that I just figured it was on Stardom World. So when I went to go record last week for it to be dropped on Monday, I was like, this is an on Star World, and I plugged the heck out of this match for this to be the first watch along for our Merry Mayu Christmas. So I just went over to Google, did a quick Google search, found it. Okay, it was there, but I went and watched it. When I did the watch along, I did it on my DVD copy. Turn, turns out the day before that we posted this live, Daily Motion took it down. So there are some people that were able to do the watch along, and some weren't. So I deeply apologize. I'm usually really good at doing my homework when it comes to this. So then what I did is the next three matches, um, the second week, third week, and fourth week of Mary Mayu Christmas, we're doing the trilogy of Mayu versus Io Shirai World of Stardom title matches. And there's one match. At, it's on YouTube, so you, it's very accessible to get to. But there's one out of the three matches, Rob, that is not on Stardom World. Can you take a guess what match it is? It's the second. Uh, oh, no. Is it the second one? It yeah. is the second one. Yep. Yep. It, the, the one that's from Year End Climax 2016, arguably the greatest Stardom match of all time. It's not on Stardom World. However, it is on YouTube in like 10 different, you know, I think there's like five or six different people that have that match on YouTube. So we're all good to go there. But again, I apologize. So what we're going to do is you're going to get not one, not two, are you not what yet? Yeah, not, not two. You're going to get two bonus watch along episodes for this month. Myself and editor in chief of the show, Sean Montrose, we are going to be doing a watch along of Mayu versus Kyrie from Historic Crossover for the uh, basically an instant classic just from about a month ago for the IWGP Women's Championship match. Sean was telling me how much he wanted to watch that match and he wanted to watch it with me. We figured, hey, let's just, it's Christmas. Let's just throw it on the Christmas list. Let's do it as a watch along. And we will give that over to our Patreon members. Now we're going to be doing another bonus watch along and I'm going to be doing it with another special person. And Rob, do you want me to tell you who that special person is? I would love you to tell me who that person is. I'm going to this person. And not only is he a handsome individual, but he's also an author. And you might say, Ooh, (laughs) what book is he an author of? He's an author of a certain book called living the dream stardom's 10th anniversary in review. (laughs) That's you, sir. One Mr. (laughs) Rob Goodwin. And folks, I had to twist Rob's arm to do this episode. I texted him and I said, Hey, I want to do, I want to keep giving more bonus episodes for Merry Mayu Christmas, would you like to do a watch along with me? And he immediately texts back, absolutely. And here's the only catch. Well, basically, it wasn't anybody's catch. I just said, Rob, you can pick the match. So do you have your, and you can tell me live on air, who will not lie, but to basically to tape, uh, what match you want to <laughs> do. So, sir, do you, do you have your match picked out yet? Or do we, should we let it cliffhang for another week? Oh, no, I've got my match. Oh, um, okay. I actually, I actually got super prepared. Because even though I had to go through the Patreon backlog to update it to the new website, I was like, oh, no, what if he's already done this one? So I've got this I and was... I've got a backup. So, Ooh. oh, honestly, I'm just so organized. So the match that we're going to be watching, Matt, is Mayu Ibatani, obviously, Merry Mayu Christmas, versus Suri from Stardom Yokohama Cinderella 20. 20- 20. So I believe that is one of Mayu's, if not the last title defense she has of the World of Stardom title belt before she drops it to Yatami. 
Yes, I only did that just for the uh, the Mayu review, but never for a watch along. So that is fantastic. Now, however, Rob did say he wanted to do a watch along to the Zest Sampu hair match. And I said, we, I said, Mayu, I said, I love it. The fans will absolutely love it. We're a podcast where we give people what they want. However, Mayu is not in that match. But for when we do it, when we do for 2023, when we do a very lady C Christmas, then yes, absolutely, buddy. We will do it then. <laughs> it doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? <laughs> I, got a, I, I got a year to work on it, buddy. I'll figure it out. Absolutely. I am expecting some sort of Christmas pun, like Lady Christmas or something <laughs> like that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you sound like you've been incredibly busy, and I'm sure, obviously, our patrons. And I do just want to shout out those uh, those people who've signed up to our patron this month. We've really do appreciate it thank you goes out to bill Corbush. is all j is is irizari i apologize as all if i've messed that up please tell me tell me on uh patreon if i've messed that up and andrew velix as well thank you for subscribing to our patreon you are massively awesome people and we massively appreciate it um Matt, shall we talk about some news before we talk about the remainder of the goddesses of stardom tag league? I love news, sir. I love it. Well, let's start with this then. So Dave Meltzer, big Davey Meltz, um, was talking about the historic crossover event. Um, and they quoted something that came out of Tokyo Sports. So I'm going to read you the quotation. And uh, I thought we could have a little bit of a chat of this. When the IWGP Women's title was announced, the plan was for Iwatani to be the first champion. Stardom had earmarked a big 2023 for her. She's already known as a stardom icon, but they were going to push that nickname harder because of the release of a major Japanese motion picture on her life that will be released in the latter part of 2023. However, she had asked to renegotiate her deal, given that holding the title would mean she would be doing a lot of US bookings as champion next year. The sides didn't come to an agreement on a new deal, but she remains under contract. So essentially, she turned down the title for now, and Kyrie, who was the second choice since she's the best-known stardom wrestler in the US, was made champion. But the idea was always for one of them and for the tournament finals to be Kyrie as the international divisional rep and Iwatani as the Japanese division rep. So it looks like... Mayu Iwatani was supposed to be winning the IWGP Women's Tournament, which, of course, many, many people, us included, had predicted that she would do. What's your sort of feeling around this? Really, if if, if you peel back the layers, it's, it's quite simple. Mayu just probably just doesn't want to travel uh, between... I mean, you'll see her in the U.S. from time to time, but you're probably looking at anywhere between 6 to you know, 10, 15 dates. And maybe she's just very comfortable in her home. Maybe she just likes being around her family and her loved ones and her dogs and and her you know whatever pet she has. And it's just maybe too much of a burden to you know to take that. You know, it's a 15, 16, 17 hour plane ride over to the states. And not only that, but yeah, obviously, you know, we still live in a world where COVID is a thing as well. And uh, I don't think Mayu is somebody that if you know when she travels, heaven forbid, if she you know she gets COVID, who knows if she's going to be down a week, two weeks, three weeks. So I, I think that's what it comes down to. And I think basically she's negotiating. She obviously she has a contract with stardom and, and I could be wrong here, but the way I see it, it, this is for the IWGP championship. So this is a completely separate, you know, this is a new Japan Bushi road side of the thing. So maybe she just figured, look, if I'm going to be inconvenienced by all this travel that I have to do, I should be compensated for it. Um, and she probably just didn't think that, Right now, the compensation wasn't there. Not only the fact, not only that fact, but they're, right now they're doing the biopic on her. So what if she's gone six months out of the year and she has no idea what they're doing on the biopic because she's not on set for it or getting updates on it because she's you know half a world away. So I just think you you throw a lot of those things on there, and it was just like you know maybe it's not just the right time for it. So I completely understand that. So uh, as somebody who just came back from a, a work trip this past week, I can understand travel can be quite a bit of a pain, uh, especially, you know, with the airports and whatnot. And maybe just right right now, that's just not the time for her. That's the way that I see it. And I would love to hear your uh, thoughts on this, sir. I mean, Mayu was the Mayu was the obvious choice to go with this. You know, I think 
Dave sort of sums it up in that first line. She's already known as the stardom icon. She was the one that didn't leave. She's been with the company since it since its inception, and she hasn't left, hasn't gone anywhere else, and she's been with the company through thick and thin. So, you know, of course Mayu is the obvious choice. Fair play to Mayu for renegotiating a contract because that is significantly more of a commitment than being just a stardom champion. And I don't mean just a stardom champion as some sort of derogatory thing towards the stardom belt. But if you're expected to do a considerable amount of travel, you know, a considerable amount of time away from home, and like you've said, she's got the film um, coming out in the latter part of 2023 as well. She does need to be fairly compensated for that, absolutely. Whereas Kyrie, Kyrie isn't working a full-time schedule with stardom. So it, you know, it would be easier for her to be the IWGP Women's Champion. Whether Mayu gets that belt, I don't know. Um, it also does make me think, why on earth would you not give Mayu her demands if you are on the other end of her renegotiating a contract because you think about what she's done, what she's done for the company, um, the matches she's put on, what she's given the company of herself. Um, I'm amazed that they didn't come to terms, unless Mayu's asking for you know, absolutely obscene terms, which, of course, she is chicken brain, as she so wonderfully said on Twitter this week. <laughs> I love how you worked that in. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I was so, I, honestly, I have I have watched that about 23 times. That, that and then just I brain this chicken, fantastic. And then it's followed up by Momo Kogo just trying to wonderfully explain that she actually means she's got a bird brain and she forgets everything. And then Mayu go, yes, yes, that is what I mean. Just brilliant. Um, well, then if that's the case, maybe they did go come to terms and Mayu forgot to sign the contract in time. <laughs> that be could be. <laughs> Turned up in the wrong <laughs> building. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's good to see that she does remain under contract, obviously. I think she's going to be a huge miss if she ever does. I know that... Oh, I can't remember when it was, but there was rumours that Tam and Mayu both had two years left before they wanted to retire. Now, I make it the end of 2023 that that, would, that date would be coming up. So, obviously, you know, we want Tam and Mayu to be safe and to be happy, but Hopefully they will continue because they're such a huge part of the roster. Um, again, well done to Mayu for sticking up for herself, basically. She, yeah. she knows what she's worth. Yep. She is the stardom icon. So, And you know what? Perhaps in the lock... I, I mean, don't get me wrong. She's dropped the SWA belt in order to uh, concentrate on the IWG belt, IWGP belt and uh, now has no belt. So that did make me laugh because it's the most Mayu thing she could have possibly done. Um, speaking of the Wrestling Observer, and of course, um, the historic crossover show, Melter did release his uh, show ratings. Um, and just a couple of things that I wanted to pull from that. Saya and Kyrie. Uh, the white belt match that went to a 30-minute time limit draw from Gold Rush. That got four stars. Uh, Suri and Utami part three for the wonder for the World of Stardom title got four and a half, as did Mayu and Kyrie on the historic crossover show. I know that we've there's a little bit of discrepancy between our ratings, Matt, but obviously ratings are completely subjective. But are you sort of Oh, hiccups. Are you sort of surprised with those ratings? Are the, you know, or do you think they're roundabout okay? I think they're roundabout okay. Even uh, whenever I kind of have my own ratings or do my own ratings, whenever Melchers comes in, very much like me and you, they're always pretty close, half a star, quarter star off. And I think you text me the ratings, and I think I had everything rated a half a star bigger. I had Kyrie and uh, Saya four and a half and then I had Mayu and Kyrie five stars and Shuri and Utami five stars so it looked like our ratings were I think me and you I think we're about the same I think I think we gave I think we had the same exact ratings on those three matches and if I'm wrong you can correct me sir but uh, yeah I mean and first of all it's great that because Dave does not do a lot of rating of uh, of really stardom matches and he really had every now and again he's been obviously doing a lot more because of the reports coming in and obviously the buzz coming in. So, and you're literally getting rated or you're having the most sell rated and the most, uh, what's what I'm looking for. Basically the most known wrestling journalist of all time, watching and rating your matches and putting into the rest of big publication, like the wrestling observer. And especially with stars that, you know, 
the matches that are getting that high quality stars from Dave Meltzer. It's only good news. It's only good news. And put more, more eyes on the product. Absolutely. Absolutely. Completely agree. Um, he doesn't do a lot of Josie coverage at all, to be perfectly honest. So to see decent amounts of uh, Josie coverage is really, really good stuff. This week, it's more time for more PWI nonsense as well, which is always fun for a couple of days to watch uh, wrestling Twitter meltdown at who they've forgotten and who's placed where. Um, but it was the term of the tag teams. And big thanks to at the Massey 2 on Twitter, who actually put in, just so that we didn't have to go through all 150 names or 100 names or whatever it was, 100 names, um, they picked out the Joshi teams. Now, obviously, the big name to come out of this is Fukuoka Double Crazy, Kogama and Haz- uh, Hazuki, who finished fifth overall out of the top 100 which is a fairly astonishing um achievement when you consider that number one was the usos number two was ftr they're keeping very very good company before i throw to you and just have your sort of say on that matt um other stardom participants on that list we had black desire at 16 Momo watanabe and starlight kid and melty at 36 tam nakano and natsupoi um what do you think? Do you think there's anyone else on looking not to be there, or do you think FWC at five? Do you think that's too high, too low? What are your opinions? No, I think they got it pretty well because uh, I, I, a lot of people would have FTR number one, but you have to understand PWI goes by wins. Again, I understand FTR, they have three belts. Same time, the Usos are the undisputed champions and the biggest wrestling company in the world. So I see why they're one and FTR is two. To have an FWC number five, and that's just not number five in like female tag teams. That's number five, five <laughs> excuse me, in all tag teams. So I thought that was a, a fantastic rating. And then you had Melt here at what, 36, 37. And considering the fact they've only been a team for about three months. So that's uh, that's pretty fantastic as well. So uh, the only really upset that I have is uh, they don't have the Stardom Cast team in there. We're me and you on that one, buddy. I think they fumbled there, but. You know, <laughs> that's just me. Yeah, of course, it's subjective. And it's all like I say, my favorite part is just watching Twitter meltdown and getting really, really, really irate over it. Um, Final thing, just before we kick into our show reviews, Shigio on Twitter has sort of translated um a little portion of a Tokyo sports article, I think, or it might have been... Um, Nick, I can't remember where it was from, if I'm being perfectly honest. But it says, on December 6th, Kyoko Kimura filed a lawsuit against Fuji TV and the Terrace House Production Companies, seeking approximately 142 million yen in damages. Now, that's roughly a million US dollars. I don't want to go into too much detail about that, because obviously that sort of summary is all I know about it. All I'm going to say is that if it stops the same thing happening again, that happened to Hannah, I think she's got to win, surely. Um, I know that there was an investigation, and uh, I think it was Fuji TV basically released a lengthy, 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 lengthy report, which basically shirked all responsibility. So, fingers crossed, Kyoko gets what she deserves, though, of course, no amount of money is going to replace what she's lost, Matt. Yeah, you hit it right on the head, buddy. There's uh, as as a parent myself, there's no amount of money or nothing that can replace losing a kid. You know, and I always tell people, it doesn't matter what I go through in life, I can pretty much go through anything, but I would never I don't know how anybody would be able to recover from losing their child. That's just not the way that the cycle of life goes. You know, it's it's unfortunate. I don't mean to sound like a downer here, because that's not me. It's unfortunate that, you know, it, we're all eventually going to pass on. But the one thing that uh, the, the, I think the hardest thing is, and I've had friends uh, that uh, and, and older and people that I know that their kids have passed on before, before they did. That's just one thing that uh, it would be next to impossible to recover. But yeah, obviously I hope that uh, she gets what, uh, what she, you know, she wins the lawsuit. Uh, like you said before that nothing can replace what she lost and losing her daughter and Hannah. And obviously the, uh, the main thing is that this never happens again, you know, and hopefully, fingers crossed and prayers of the Lord. Let's move on to our show reviews then. So we start with night nine of the 2022 Stardom Goddess of Stardom Tag League Tour. Um, Saturday, 3rd of November from my favorite venue in the world, Bell Sal, Takadano Baba in Tokyo in front of 408 people. I reckon that's probably the and best I've ever n- said that. 
nailed it. Take that chicken brain. <laughs> <laughs> we opened the show with a stardom rumble with Saya Kamatani winning the 13 woman stardom rumble by last eliminating super stardom machine with the star crusher in 16 minutes and three seconds, two rumbles, Two appearances from Superstar and Machine. This is the stuff that dreams are made of, Matt. I was literally again. I was in Orlando this last three days for a work, a work, uh, a work thing, and I'm literally on my phone, uh, sitting in my hotel room, just trying to get caught up with all the stuff so we can do the podcast. And I was as soon as Superstar and Superstar and Machine came out, I literally jumped up and was like, "Rob is probably so happy right now." But then eventually, <laughs> she she eats the star the Star Crusher from Sai Kamatani, and because uh, that's Sai Kamatani needs more momentum going into the biggest the biggest show of the year. I was, and it was over the top. I was like, "I'm never thinking." I love Sai Kamatani. She's my wrestler of the year. I hope she holds that white belt forever and then wins the red belt. But it's like you couldn't put like Tekla over or anybody. <laughs> Our lady C or or the or the the semifinalists in this match. Uh, but well, yeah, I thought this was the match was really, really fun. I didn't give it any rating. I thought it was really fun, just the way to kind of get the bigger stars on the show. And uh we get two two showings from uh, your all time favorite stardom wrestler in the last, you know, five or six weeks. So you gotta be over the moon, buddy. Absolutely. I I think it's only a matter of time before she's inserted into the Red Bell picture, and rightly so, I think. I think um we'll have to Or wait even bigger. Or even bigger, they do the second Zest uh, Salon <laughs> shampoo match with a mask. <laughs> There's only one winner there, isn't it? Um, post-match. Yeah, you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, post-match, Haruka Umasaki, who, of course, is a member of Diana. Um, she's been on a couple of new blood shows, and she's uh, recently debuted a fire-throwing alter ego called Karma. Um, and she's been recently rubbing shoulders with Awera Tai. She comes in to challenge Saya for the white belt at Ria Goku. Um, uh, initially, Saya turns her down, um, and she then gets beaten up by Awera Tai, who stormed the ring. Um, basically beats her up until she says, yeah, go on, then we'll have a match. And that's how the segment ends. Um, this, of course, has been confirmed that it is going to be um, the white belt match for Rio Goku. We are going to go through that card um, and we're going to preview the show in a different podcast episode. Um, we'll leave our opinions um, about this until we go through the um, Dream Queendom card a bit later, Matt. Um, but just this segment, um, what did you think of this? I thought it was very weird how it was like, that's we need to find a way to get to this match without this person really having an official match in stardom because she's just been on new blood shows she's never been on stardom proper correct uh as far as i'm aware yeah so it's like well we're just going to keep beating you up until you get what you want like i, I don't know is that how things work i don't know <laughs> why don't you just i don't know i get things what i want by hard work and being polite but you know hey whatever <laughs> nah man you need run-ins from your friends um <laughs> Uh, I want a milkshake, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on then to match two. Goddess of Storm Tag League 2022 Red Block match. Black Desire moving to seven points, defeating Peach Rock, who remain on four. Um, Starlight Kid pinning Momo Kogo with the Moonsault in eight minutes and 23 seconds. Save for a few really ropey spots, this might be the most competitive I've ever seen Momo Kogo. And I thought she had really, really, really good chemistry with Starlight Kid. Um, and they're doing quite well to build her as this resilient babyface, Matt. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Momo Kogo. And like I said, I was a big fan of this team after their first match, just their timing and just, I mean, it's, it's Mayu and she's she's done it with Saida. She's done it with Hazuki. She's done it with Koguma. She's done it with Hannah. It just seems like whoever she teams with in stars, they're always going to get a rub and their double teams are always going to be in sync on time and really good ring positioning. And there's some really good stuff here. And they even, they hearken back to a lot of the MK sisters stuff. We've been seeing the last few matches with like the double six, one, nine. Obviously we got some, uh, some stuff with Mayu versus Momo Watanabe, which I will never, ever get sick of. But yeah, the main crux of this match was Starlight Kid versus uh, Momo Kogo, which was really, really good. And uh, I thought that um, Starlight Kid did enough to give Momo enough in this match to kind of put a little shine onto her, which again, it's it's literally wrestling one-on-one. It makes sense. Starlight Kid built her up, 
towards the end of the match and then what ultimately happens she winds up beating her so she's helping her helping momo out but helping herself out too in the end uh which is just really good psychology and you see that in a lot of these tag matches but uh, i really like what they're doing with momo kogo because i think coming off this tournament i think her stock was is really really going up so i thought this was this match was great and i had it at a three and three four stars i thought it was really really solid yeah, it was solid. Um, I gave it a, I gave it three and a quarter actually. I think. Um, ju- I don't know why there was just it was a match. I mean, there was lots of little bits in it. Like obviously, we had little glimpses of Mayu versus Starlight, for example. And I, I do really enjoy Momo Kogo, but it didn't quite reach it for me. Just it was a good match though. Um, moving on to match three, then a blue block match. My Himmy moving to ten points, defeating Waka Wild, who remain on two points. Uh, Himika submitting Waka Sukiyama with the high angle Boston Crab in five minutes and fifty seconds. Speaking of resilient baby faces, Matt, this match was far more fun than it had any right to be. Yeah, I thought it was really good. We've noticed this, and I've said this on this podcast a few times before. Whenever they were doing the multi-person matches with Cosmic Angels and Donald Del Mundo, uh, uh, Himika really does a good job feeding and selling for Waka. Considering the size difference and the strength difference, like when she's throwing the form, she's really letting uh, Waka get in there. And she does a really good job bumping and feeding for Waka. And then ultimately, we all know what's going to happen. A zillion layer, it's a power bomb, and then like a Boston Crab. But it, I just think that the two of them have really, really good chemistry. And I never know I needed a Saki versus Micah match, but their stuff was really, really good too. Like right in the beginning, they only, they're only in there like 45 50 seconds but like the, everything they had was just snap it was on point everything made sense this match didn't wear out as welcome like you said before they're good sir less than six minutes but i thought this was uh pretty solid i had three and a quarter stars and a finish you don't see uh Himika win quite often with this uh, high angle boston crab so good job kind of mixing up the finishers here Absolutely, and that's something that I think that Stardom do quite well. Um, I think, to be honest, I do remember that Saki and Micah, I believe, had one of the, uh, certainly one of Saki's better matches in the five star. So the five star, uh, yes. yeah. Go and check that out if you haven't seen it already. Can we just talk for a minute though about that knee strike from Himika? Because mother of God, that sounded fantastic. So she hits that jumbo Sharuta knee strike to Himika, uh, sorry, not to Himika, to uh, Waka. And it just, the crunch of it, just the timing of it, the execution, oh, looked fantastic, sounded brutal, loved it. Um, I gave it three stars. I was tempted to give it three and a quarter just for the knee strike, but I didn't in the end. I was being a, I was being a negative person today, apparently. Um, match four then, another blue block match. Seven up, Nene Takahashi and you moving to nine points, defeating O2 line who remain on two with the diving body press from you on Mio Amasaki in seven minutes and 14 seconds. Now, I'm happy to admit that at the start of this tournament, I was unsure of what to make of you. Um, not you personally, Matt, as in you, the wrestler. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad you cleared that up. <laughs> and she's proved me spectacularly wrong. And honestly, she's regularly one of the most entertaining women on these Star uh, Stardom Tag League cards. I see your point. And I think Nanai Takahashi has been absolutely fantastic. However, I have, and we'll get, we'll get into this when we get into the final and we kind of do a little mini preview for their tag title match. The biggest problem I have with her in this tournament is that she's selling either very little or next to none. She didn't sell anything at all in this match. Now, I understand Miyu Yamasaki's forearms, God bless her, are absolutely horrible. They wouldn't break an egg. <laughs> Obviously, that's something they literally could probably take Mi- Miyu aside behind, and it's something that's very teachable. There's a lot of hard hitters in Stardom, especially in that Queen's Quest faction, where they literally can just take her aside for an hour and have her practice her forearms. But she sold, like, next to nothing for Azumi. You were... um the show that they wrestled Mirai and Ami. Sorry, that was you were you were not there. That that's when you broke your foot doing the Cosmic Angels dance. Of course. So I never really got chance. Yes, I never got a chance to throw this off you, but she sold absolutely nothing for Mirai at all. One of the hardest hitters and the most pushed pushed wrestlers and this year in stardom. Didn't sell anything at all for her. Mike and Himika, she sold a little bit there. Uh Utami, we'll get into that in the final. But uh, it just when you don't sell or not selling enough, 
it takes away any drama into the match. Now, maybe this match, I understand. It's fourth on the card. It's not a big match. It's, I'm obviously going to have a problem if she's no-selling in that title match. Again, we'll get into it uh, coming up at the end of the month. But uh, other, I mean, her offensive stuff looks really good. And I talk about she's like, she's wrestling like she's 10. She's like, she's in her mid thirties. I think she's 42, 43. I think she's fantastic. The stuff she did with the Zumi to start off the match, I thought was really good. She kept up with the Zumi's pace. And O2 line, they always seem to add like a new wrinkle in every one of their matches. And this one was they these awesome like pinning combination where they kept just stacking one person up on top of another and just made sure that, that when they got done doing these pinning combinations, the legal person was on top for the fall, which makes a lot of which really makes me happy as a fan of 1980s wrestling. The legal man is huge. Uh, with me when they do tag team wrestling. So the fact that they uh, they kept that in mind when they were doing the pinning combinations, I thought was fantastic. But uh, yeah, like I said, this lack of you selling for me, n- not you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I threw that right back at you. Um, you know, in some of these matches, and, and again, maybe it's by design, you know, we'll see, but uh, it's kind of just, uh, it kind of takes, takes a little bit away of stuff for me. So um, uh, that being said, I had it at three and a quarter stars. Same as me. Same as me. Um, I thought there was a couple of cool things in this match. I really enjoyed um, you having Azumi on her back and then cannonballing into Mio in the corner. Thought that was really cool. Um, there was an Azumi sushi near fall on Nene that had me biting like unbelievably close uh, near fall. But yeah, overall, it was fine. I think there just needs to be a little less screaming from Nene. Um, I think putting her in a tag team where she's not in the ring all the time does help with the lessening of the screaming, but even so. Um, post-match, Azumi is challenged by Hikari Shimizu. Uh, this is her first appearance in Stardom since September, as she's just been on a stint in CMLL in Mexico. Um, and obviously, Azumi at the moment is one defense away from tying Mayu Iwatani's defense record of nine. Um, she agrees that, again, this is going to be at Rio Goku. And then we get a little preview, which we don't usually get, Matt. It's usually a case of, I'm challenging for the belt. Yeah, all right, then off we go. However, we had a little bit of a high-speed exchange. It was quite exciting. Yeah, it's like, here you go. First taste is for free. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what they're going to do. Because it's like with this, again, we'll get into it more later, but you have two title challengers that really aren't starting regulars on your biggest show. So at one point, you're kind of like scratching your head if you just watch Stardom. But at the same time, it's like, I thought the booking of this segment was really good. It's like, well, you don't know who this person is challenging Azumi. Let's just give you a little bit of a sprinkle. So, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be exciting come the 29th of December. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there because this is, I imagine... Well, no, I imagine. I have seen vocally announced on Twitter by almost everyone. Um, That's a big thing at the moment. You know, there is a lot of people who are not stardom regulars that are now getting the push um, on this big show. But we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, Let's move on to match five on this show, which is another goddess of Storm Tag League. Match Red Block, Meltier moving to 10 points, defeating Peach Rock with Natsupoi pinning Momokogo with the Ferial Gift in 8 minutes and 34 seconds. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed both of Meltier's matches and actually both of Peach, well, all three of Peach Rock's matches because it is double duty for Peach Rock tonight, Matt. Yeah, and they did a good job. Uh, Momo Kogo coming in, holding her ribs, selling. Um, I've got they did that a good as a job with that. I thought they both did yeah. tremendously well, but Momo yeah. especially. Yeah, I mean, Mayu is, we talk all the time how f- fantastic seller she is, and that just adds to so much drama of her matches and pulls you in for motion. Um, but I thought that was awesome. Like, as soon as they cut the curtain, it's like you already know that they're already behind, you know, a few points, a few goals, a few runs. And then they're going up against the tag champ. So it's just like you throw that on top of it. But there was really good fighting underneath from Momokogo. Obviously, Mayu is Mayu. She's fantastic. And they do a really good job of using their double teams to kind of isolate Tam at one point and Momo at another point. Or, uh, excuse me, uh, Tam at one point and Natsupoi at another point. And then there was a really good uh, closing, finishing stretch or towards the end with Mayu and Tam. And we never really saw the conclusion really of their feud. They had that match uh, um, at the, I think it was November of last year for Tam's white belt where it went to a 30 minute time limit draw. So there's still that story there. So you were able to kind of sprinkle a little of that stuff in and their, uh, you know, their exchanges were really, really good. And then I thought the finish was just fantastic with 
a few double teams on Momo Kogo. She's selling the hurt ribs. And what does the Fairy Old Gift focus on? The ribs. Simple storytelling, folks. Very well done between not only two great teams, but four fantastic wrestlers. I had this one at three and three fourth stars. Yeah, I had it at three and a half. Um, really good match. Really good um, showcase again for Momo Kogo. I do enjoy any time Mayu and Tam have a chance to wrestle. Um, the big takeaway from me in this match was the meltier entrance doesn't really work in the smaller venues, does it, Matt? It's it's definitely one made for the bigger shows. <laughs> well, I'll say this. Like, when you have the smaller venues on a scale of 1 to 10, the meltier entrances are a 10. On the bigger venues, they're a hundred out of one to ten. So I see your, I totally see your point of view. Again, I was, I had so much of. The, I thought I was gonna have some free time watching these matches while I was away at this work thing. That didn't happen. So I was waiting about three hours for my plane, and I was like, "Oh, I'll watch this match." So I had my notebook out and I had this ma- watching this match. And a newer person that's with our company about a year, who I've only met a couple times, literally sat down next to me. And he's like, hey, what are you watching? As Meltier is doing their entrance. <laughs> so, so, so it's like, I don't have to. I don't, I'm like, I can't explain this. And it's like, what are you doing taking notes? There wasn't supposed to be any notes taking during the seminar. And I was like, well, <laughs> to one of my side things that I do, and I was like, I'll have to watch this match at a later time. Because how am I going to explain these two people dressed up as princesses will kick your face off but yeah, uh, but yeah you're right that 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 meltier entrance does uh it works a little bit better in the bigger venues it certainly <laughs> does yeah certainly does uh, <laughs> let's move on it to match six then the semi-main of this show which was a red block match we love tokyo sports moving to four points defeating the karate brave team um, of Suri and Tomoka Inaba in, um, who remain on seven points with the Kishkasai in seven minutes and 41 seconds. I love the continued story of Saki being terrified of Suri. It's it's such a fantastically funny overarching theme. Um, you've got all of the tie hiding behind death during the Karate Braves entrance and then jumping when they scream. Um, Saki calling in death when she thinks it's Inaba starting and turning around and finding it's Siri, which is hilarious. And I love to- I love how we love Tokyo Sports. Are they're hilarious when they deviate from their tired shtick. They often get hamstrung by the fact that they do the same thing, the same spots over and over and over again. But when they do something different, because Saki especially has got such organic, phenomenal comic timing that stuff like this is done so well like when she drags Suri out of the ring then realizes what she's done bows to her and runs away and then Suri's chasing around the outside of the ring as the match is still going on inside that's genuinely funny okay we don't need newspapers and you know pretend smoking and stuff like that to be funny Stuff like that is legitimately funny. And can we just appreciate Saki gets a win over Suri, a three-way at Dream Queendom. Give us what we want, Rossi. Come I on. Literally have that, I literally have that written down. Does this mean three-way at Dream Queendom? Saki, <laughs> Red Velvet. I'll tell you what, man. We're on the same page as always. Always. always, always. Saki, two belts. Saki two oh. belts at the end of the 29th. There it is, buddy. <laughs> Imagine 2023 ends with Saki Kashima holding that red belt aloft. And let's be honest, we are joking, but she would thoroughly deserve it. Um, I did really enjoy a wedding tie chaining Suri to a chair as well. That was really funny. Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's call it like how it is, but they tried to chain Siri to a chair. Oh, yeah. Between all, <laughs> all 48 members, they couldn't figure it out. And here's Sherry, the biggest badass in the company, one of the biggest badasses in all of wrestling. God bless her, trying to sell it. Then eventually she was like, all right, like I can't. I can't. This is terrible. You guys can't figure out. This is like having a a (laughs) kindergarten try to tie a shoe. It's just not happening. And I like the fact that they, while while that was happening, they tried to build heat on Inaba. Completely, (laughs) completely discrediting the fact that Inaba in this tournament, I said this last week, in this tournament, she's like kicking harder than Sherry, which is crazy. It's like Sherry's kicking at a level of one to ten, like a twelve, and Hinduba's kicking like at a fifteen level. Like it's just like holy jeez. And then when they do that like kick sandwich that like sets up for the finishing stretch, you're like but what's worse, the front or the back? But it's like, yeah, they're starting to build a little bit of heat on Inaba, and she just throws one kick to Saki. At that point, Saki's like, 
well, now who do I face? The person who's came my chest in or the person that I'm afraid of over here? <laughs> and then the ultimate end is just is the Kishi Kasai for the finish. It's like, geez, like poor Sherry. It's like, here's this person definitely afraid of me. And I have one win in like four years over. <laughs> And I think as well, like you, you talked about that change, but I think at one point, Momo Watanabe just literally draped it on her because <laughs> it was just a case of this. This clearly isn't working. We just need to just just put the chain on her or near her, okay? <laughs> she cracked up too. Again, here's yeah. another big badass. And like, Momo she, she's sitting here. It's like, well, here's my big rival that I can't get past. You know, she beat me for the for the belt. Or I couldn't beat her for the belt, and I lost her in the five stars. So here's my big rival. And I'm going to get her with this chain. Ah, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I enjoyed this match far more than I should have done. I gave it three and a half, Matt. I had it at three and a quarter. Um, I thought the finishing sequence was obviously it was mostly a comedy match. I thought maybe the last 80 or 90 seconds between Saki and Sherry, I thought was really good with the back and the forth of the Kishi Kasai and the, uh, you know, the white dragon and everything like that. So, yeah, I thought it was, uh, it was a good comedy match. And then the last 90 seconds, they really gave us a, a good finishing stretch between the, uh, the, our champion and the, uh, the champion of our hearts. Let's just put that. <laughs> um, let's move on to our main event then uh, blue block match, which saw FWC move to eight points, defeating the new eras who remain on seven with a small package um uh, in 10 minutes and 20 seconds um someone is going to have to explain the dolphin balloon to me um because i i can't for the life of me work out why uh why my um my, why mariah is bringing yeah. this bru- uh, balloon into the ring there's they're not in the dolphin r- arena in nagoya nor is anyone in this match from nagoya i i do not understand that are you able to enlighten me I'm going to put two they're just clearly guesses. Uh, one, maybe Mariah's a fan of the American football team, the Miami Dolphins. I mean, or yeah. The, or the other one is she just lost a bet. Maybe they were like, we're going to draw straws <laughs> or whoever, whoever loses out of these five or six people, they have to carry this dolphin to the ring. And maybe, or maybe what happened was Rossi Ogawa said, look, Mariah, we're going to have you win this Cinderella tournament. But seven months afterwards, you're going to have to carry a, a, doll, a balloon dolphin to the ring. And then she's like, yeah, okay, I, you got it, boss. No problem. And right before she came out, Gossip Guy was like, remember that deal that you made with me? Here. <laughs> it's time to pay. I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought this match was fantastic. Um, once again, FWC proving why they're, in my eyes, the best team in stardom. Um uh, but again, there was just so many different cool spots. That Tower of Doom spot was insane. The stereo diving crossbody and suicide dive spot from FWC was great. Hazuki is finally getting better at hitting those suicide dives. I don't fear for her safety every time she does them now. There was one moment where she tried to do the Mayu uh, Lucha arm drag and uh, just about gets over with the help of Ami and, Sh- uh, Ami and Mirai. But other than that, I thought this match was good. It at 10 minutes it didn't overstay its welcome it was fast paced i loved it three and three quarter stars matt yeah i had it three and uh three four stars um i thought psychology was really good about how when uh, Mirai and Koguma started out, so you kind of had that like your the little bit of a feel of their uh, their final match from the Cinderella tournament, and Mirai was getting up a little bit on Koguma. FWC was like, "Well, hey, we're the you know we're the former champs," so they get the first advantage with some double teams, and then um, they, it gets turned right around. I mean, Mirai come in like, "Oh no, no, we're you know we're on equal footing here," so they use double teams to get their advantage. I liked it how the story they told in the beginning of the match is you have two babyface teams that are over with the crowd in order for that are kind of on equal footing. And the only really way to get the clear advantage in the beginning is to basically have a two on one advantage. And they basically flip it. They go 50, 50 there. And then we get like a mini match with Suzuki and Mirai, which uh, that was absolutely fantastic. And then you have, yeah, you have obviously Ami Sori just kabashi style chopping everybody that's in the ring. That's uh, didn't come to the room with a, um, a, a balloon animal, but, uh, <laughs> and then I thought it was, I thought how, uh, the finishing stretch was really good, how they just kept putting constant pressure on Kagama to get the fall. And any time that Hazuki would try to interfere, somebody would kind of, you know, pitch her out, basically, you know, divide and conquer uh, scenario. But Kagama is the queen of the uh, the cradle pins. And ultimately, that's basically what does in uh, uh, the new era. So I thought the match was really good. The psychology was really good. And with two babyface tag teams that are, you know, e- equal in points, you have a six versus seven. Going into the final, I thought that um, 
I thought they did a really good job of keeping everybody on equal footing and a great way to close the show, especially with for uh, Wado Tai doing the jump <laughs> afterwards. And I was like, and then Kokomo's, uh, Kokomo's promo afterwards was like, okay, you came and beat everybody up. And then, uh, you know, we thought you say what you had to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, we didn't talk about actually something that I meant to earlier. Um, oh no, doesn't matter. Ignore me. Ignore me. We did. Um, Something I did want to talk about. Um, in the apparent theme of tonight, which is people challenging losing champions, um, Ruak comes out, challenges Ami Suri for the future of Stardom Championship, though according to Ami, it should have been Rina. So it was quite an underwhelming title challenge, um, but that isn't going to be at Dream Queen, and it is instead going to be at New Blood. I must admit, and this is um, sort of emphasised on uh, the second night that we're going to be looking at, I think Ruwaka has massively improved whilst being in this tag team with Nats Katora, Matt. Absolutely. Uh, we've been saying it on this podcast since the tournament started, but how impressed we are with Ruwaka's improvement, considering the fact that she was pretty much the only one in the last seven or eight months that have shown, you know, next to no improvement at all. And once they put her in this team with Tori, you can just see that she almost like, she even seems like she's got more energy when she's like walking to the ring. Like she seems like she's, she just, she's, more what's the word i'm looking for it's like she's more focused she's mm -hmm. more energized she's more like motivated to do better but we've been seeing it not only in that the tag matches with torah but even like the the singles matches and multi-person matches she's been having in between the uh you know in between the tournament so i'm really happy to to see her improving i think she's only 18 or 19 so i mean she's got you know light years ahead of her to uh, just keep getting better and better and, and i'm brings a smile to my face anytime you see anybody getting better at their job yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Kogama then struggles with basic, basic mathematics as to how they are going to go through on the final night, which makes me laugh. Um, because he's like, yeah, we only need, we're only going to wrestle one match. And as Hazuki's like, we're going to be wrestling two. What? <laughs> two matches. Are we? What? What are I doing? No, the final. Oh, yeah. And it's like, God's mm. sake, Kogama. <laughs> <laughs> then Kagama does a great job selling tickets. Yes, if you want to see FWC Absolutely. wrestle twice, come see us. What a <laughs> what a ticket seller. Way to go, Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> Talk them into the building, Kagama. <laughs> um, and again, let's move up. What a segue into the final. I mean, we talked about the final night. Look at that. Um, night 10 of the Tag League, which of course doubles as the final Sunday, the 4th of December from the Makahari Mess International Exhibition Hall in Chiba in front of 700, pardon me, and 31 people. Apparently, this is the first time Stardom has run the venue, though the Tokyo Comic Con was there the previous day, which saw uh, the Stars team of Hazuki, Kogame, and Sayuri the defeat Queen's Quest, Azumi, Lady C, and Utami in 18 minutes and 51 seconds, which I believe you can now see on Stardom World. And if you can't, I think it's on there, the Stardom YouTube channel. Um, it, is, it, it is. It is, Rob. If you listened to last week's show, which I know you, we all know why you weren't there. You were trying to, you were going for the backup <laughs> dancer to be for Meltier. I did. Uh, I, I covered that that match buddy there you go, there you go. See, what a guy what a guy honestly <laughs> <laughs> um in terms of the attendance uh capacity was around 1500 pre-covid um but this number is healthier than new japan's number that they drew in february in this venue whilst on their new year's golden series um they got about 400 people in but that wasn't a final or a pay-per-view and had no title matches so it's it's not really a fair comparison um before we go into the card itself matt two words well technically three words four words four words see i've gone full cogman now um, <laughs> another pay-per-view like, yeah, I think I, I remember I was telling you about it. Like, this is a pay-per-view tomorrow. I was like, yeah, man, it's the finals. <laughs> this is this means that they have had three pay-per-views in three weeks. Gold Rush, Historic Crossover, and the final of the Tag League. Not including and, the opening night of the Tag League. And Starman and, uh, Show Showcase. Starman Showcase, yep. This is getting a bit ridiculous now. Like, I'm not being funny, but from a money standpoint, not from, you know, the more stardom, the better. I'm never going to be, you know, I'm never going to be like, oh, it's too much stardom. But from a money standpoint, that's an outrageous number of pay-per-views to run. That's basically averaging a pay-per-view every week. 
that's that's not sustainable we're gonna have to um and you probably have it there because you're it's, you're so organized and you 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 know that's the reason why he wrote the book starting living the dream 10th anniversary <laughs> review but i i would like to see maybe we'll maybe we'll do it on when we do our year-end review how many how many pay-per-views stardom ran this year because this is like yeah this is this almost reminds me very much of like in the mid 90s where you would have a wwf pay-per-view one week a wcw pay-per-view the next week and then two weeks later an ecw pay-per-view mm-hmm. so and then you're and then you're trying to get the algebra and New Japan pay per views from VHS. That's old I am, folks. Not DVD. That didn't exist in 96, 97. <laughs> VHS. So you're trying to work with your tape traders, you know, to, you know, to get that in. But this is, yeah, it's, it's kind of what this reminds me of. It seems like there's a pay per view almost every week. And I don't think there's another one until uh, Dream Queendom. But then we have the next week, we have, I know it's not, a, a, it's a New Japan pay per view, but you have the Kyrie versus Tam match. And I know they're doing a big show the day before on the third and i think and i think in yokohama budokan yeah it's the opening of the th- triangle derby yeah and then what if that's going to be a pay-per-view because you know they're going to do a big show because you're having more people in very much what they do at wrestlemania you know uh weekend in the states is all the independent shows they all run shows around there because they're having more people in for wrestlemania where you get an indie that's running four or five hundred will get a thousand because you have more people there. So I understand why Simon's running that show on the third, because there's going to be more people in that area for, um, for wrestle kingdom. So I, I get that, but it's like, what I'm trying to say is I wonder if that third, if they're going to make it a pay-per-view. They've made the opening of the Cinderella, the opening of the five star and the opening of the tag league, a pay-per-view. You can bet your bottom dollar that they are going to make the opening of this, especially as they've sort of, especially on like Twitter and stuff, they've made a big hoo ha of it being the four tournaments. So you can guarantee this is going to be treated in the exact same way. The final is going to be a, a pay per view, and the opening is going to be a pay per view. Um, my issue well, with right. that is when a random show in the middle becomes a pay per view as well. It's like, why? Well, Rob, you just asked me to bet my bottom dollar. I really can't bet my bottom dollar because I have to use that dollar to order all these pay-per-views. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, mate, it's the cost of living crisis. I'm currently living in a shed uh, <laughs> just to afford the tag league. Um, yeah, in all seriousness, I I cannot see how this is sustainable because they are going to have people who just won't tune in, whether it's a no. case of they they don't put the showcase shows on pay-per-view or... I don't know, but honestly, I would be amazed if Stardom have run less than 15 pay-per-views this year. Which I can guarantee they have because there's been three Stardom in showcases that have all been pay-per-views. You've got the closing night of Tag League, the opening night of Tag League, the opening two nights of the Five Star, the final of the Five Star, and then I believe two dates in the middle of the Five Star. You've got all of the actual show shows, so Stardom X Stardom, um, Hiroshima Goddess Festival, uh, Midsummer. You had the two Midsummer shows. So you got random dates of the Cinderella, Nagoya Supreme Fight. You've got both nights of World Climax. You've also got, of course, Dream Queendom as well. I'd be amazed that we aren't nearing 20 pay-per-views. Folks, if you ever wonder what we do with your Patreon money, <laughs> literally all that money goes back into stardom yeah. like i'm not joking like all the advertisement and stuff like that but now it's just like a lot of it does go into the pay-per-view i'm not gonna lie and we thank you but uh yeah it's it's I mean, if they doubled the price of stardom world and they gave you all the pay-per-views i would be fine with that i even if they doubled the price of stardom World and gave you more of the back catalog i'd be fine with but it's at a point where it's like new japan does it I mean, they just started doing random pay-per-views here and there. The WWE Network, when it first came out, was ten bucks. You got everything. And then it moved over to Peacock. It's four ninety nine. All the pay-per-views are on there. So it's like, I think that's a model they're going to have to go by. Where it's like you can either like if they gave you different tiers of Stardom World, where it's I think in the states it's like seven fifty. But if they moved it up to where well, it's going to be fifteen sixteen dollars, but you get all the pay-per-views included. I'm like, yes, absolutely. I think that's something that they have to look at. Um, uh, as well but honestly we talk about all the time we're just we just want them to do live shows to get the shows up in less than three days yeah, like oh, god yes <laughs> um let's move on to the actual i know it sounds like i'm being negative and i'm really really yes sorry, but... yes we love stardom you're the best <laughs> <laughs> but let's that... talk about this match where we hate the winners of these finals damn it <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's not the last time that we're going to be a little bit negative on this on this podcast. Um, match one then, Goddess of Storm Tag League 2022 Blue Block match. O2 Line defeating Wacky Wild. Um, O2 Line moving to four points with Miyu Amasaki getting the win with the Tenzai in six minutes and 22 seconds. Poor Wacker is absolutely devastated with the loss. Breaks down on time at the end. It's a heartbreaking story. But my question to you, Matt, is how long, and I think we've we've talked about this at length before, how long we can carry on this losing streak of Wacker and it being endearing and us getting behind her. Does she win the Rumble at Sumo Hall? Is that is is that officially announced? The participants are not announced, but there is a rumble announced. Okay, I'm gonna say it has to because not only that, here's something else too. She's been losing for so long. You look who you have as your two leaders of your faction. You have the tag champs, former white belt champion, former high speed champion, and someone who was in the finals. So it's at a point. Right again, let's go back to your favorite football slash soccer team. If you have a player. That's constantly stinking it up, missing shots, or it's a goalie, constantly giving up goals. You're going to keep them on your team any longer than a year, like basically what they're doing with Waka. So like it's almost at a point where it like doesn't make sense. Where if she doesn't get a win, don't you think Tam's like, you're out? Obviously, we don't want that to happen, but it's like it kind of discredits Cosmic Angels when you have a member that's constantly losing. Mm. But I think that you're right. I think she wins this Rumble. Uh, obviously, she's fantastic in the ring. She's so endearing. We love her. But it's at a point, it's like you're playing this out so long that it's like you should have pulled maybe the trigger on it about three or four months ago. And I know she had that neck injury and she she got hurt and that kind of delayed things. But yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I think that she has to win the rumble at Sumo Hall or else it's like, what are you doing at this point, you know? Um other than that, I quite enjoyed this match. I'm not gonna lie, Matt. Just- this match was great. I love really the stuff with uh, Waka and Izumi and Izumi and, so- and uh, Saki. I thought it was really, really good there, like fast paced action. And again, O2 Line adding more stuff into their arsenal with like the uh, basically the uh, the double stomp pedigree. I thought that was pretty much cool. I guess that was their, uh, their, their tag team finisher. But I thought everything uh, flowed real well. I thought everything, you know, was really good. Obviously, Waka is very capable in the ring. And Izumi is Izumi. She's one of the best wrestlers in the world. So. I thought it was a really good way to uh, to start the show, and I had it at three and a quarter stars, sir. Um, moving on to obviously those two teams already eliminated, no way of getting through to the final. Same with these two teams as well. We're doing all the blue blonde matches to start the show. The new eras move to nine points, defeating Wingori with Amisori getting the pinfall over Hannon with the incredible like a thunderbolt in nine minutes and 13 seconds chops 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 for days matt and judo throws and judo <laughs> throws absolutely <laughs> yeah that's what this match was you had a lot of firing up i thought uh as good as saida is and mariah and ami sorry i thought hana was the star of the show breaks my heart that i paid all this money for this pay-per-view and i did not get the theme song but you know <laughs> <laughs> that's Hey, okay, you know what? You win some, you lose some. However, I thought the match was really good. Uh, really good finishing close the stretch. They did a really good job. You know, Mariah and Ami, sorry, obviously not going to the finals, but they did a good job closing up the block with nine points with that absolutely horrendous, but safe, like a Thunderbolt. Really good, uh, really good way for them to uh, close out their tournament. I had this match at three and a half stars. Yeah, same here. It was It was a decisive victory for the New Eras, who finished middle of the block, but only two points behind the eventual winners. So still kept strong. Uh, Wingori, again, always impressed by Wingori, and they have such fantastic chemistry as well. Um, Match three, again, the blue block. Uh, FWC, both these teams still in the tournament as it stands. If my Himmy win, they are going top. Uh, But FWC win, going to 10 points, defeating my Himmy, eliminating them with uh, Hazuki getting the pinfall with the Hazuki Strahl in 10 minutes and 18 seconds. Uh, what this means is that, again, as I've already mentioned, this eliminates my Himmy from a tournament that almost everybody else thought they should win. And whoever wins the next match between 7-Up and BMI 2000 will top the block and go through to the final. Now, 
first things first, we'll, we'll talk about that in the next match because they're the two competitors in that match. I thought this was one of the better matches in the tag league. I thought that, again, FWC just looked so cohesive and they're such a unit. And my Himmy, who... I don't want to say their tournament has been disappointing. I think I'm just a little bit sour from the fact they didn't win. But they really stepped up in this match. There have been matches where, I don't want to say they've been sleepwalking through it, but they, it hasn't popped like a lot of, especially Himika's matches have recently. She seems to have been holding something back, whereas they properly threw everything at each other, especially Hazuki in this match, who just seemed to be on the war path throughout it, Matt. I see your point with like Mike and Himika. I think maybe against the teams, like the the lower card teams that are kind of like, let's go out there five, six minutes, let's shine them up a little, and then we'll hit them with our stuff and take it home. Home. I see your point. I thought they had, a, and when we do our wrap up of our top five teams and matches, I thought they had a, you know, you'll see, I thought they had a fantastic tournament, especially with the bigger matches. Um, but I agree with you. This is not only one of the better matches of the tournament, one of the better tag matches I've seen in stardom this year. And uh, I will say, as much as I love Hazuki, I have, you know, Hazuki, Hazuki's like slightly below Tam on like my, my, my schoolboy crushes of, <laughs> of these people in stardom. And I've never been so heartbroken to see Hazuki win a match because I was like, oh my God, that means this, that means these are, they're, we're going to get what? I was like, oh my God. And I did not see it coming at all. I figured maybe they should have put this match on last if my him, if my him was going to win just to build the drama. And I was like, yeah, whatever. This will be kind of just like as a, but my Himika is they're going to win this match because there's no way that, you know, Mike and Himika aren't going to win this tournament, right? Me and you predicted it. That always, that's, that's always the double <laughs> thumbs up, right? You know, the double stamp of approval. Dude, I have told and maybe, you, we need to stop predicting things if we want them to happen. <laughs> Especially when me and you agree on it. But, oh, it's uh, even worse. Yeah, we did get Julia right winning the, the tournament. But, uh, <laughs> it was the, old, it was the only here. person who could. <laughs> yeah, I guess we were, you know, the old saying, you've been a broken clock's right twice a day. Absolutely. But uh, no, this match was fantastic. Obviously, I'm a big fan of both these teams. Uh, I thought the uh, this was nonstop action, but it wasn't like so fast where you couldn't keep up with it. It was one thing would happen, they let it register, boom. Another thing would happen, they let it register, boom. It was a 50-50 match kind of really back and forth. And then you get just uh, Himika just really putting the blitz onto Hazuki, uh, getting towards the end. And then she goes for the concussion bomb and gets get, uh, she and Hazuki escapes into the Hazuki strap cradle for three. I thought the timing and everything was really good. The crowd psychology was really good. They popped everything when they needed to put everything up, when they needed to pop it. They had the right spots at the right time. Everybody looked like a star. All teams looked really good. It was a very even kill match. And like I said, I absolutely loved this match. I had actually had it at four and a half stars. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, I I gave it four. I think it's certainly top three matches of the tournament so far. It's just a shame that it left such a sour taste in the mouth. Um, speaking of sour taste, match four, Goddess of Storm Tag League 2022 Blue Block, which effectively doubles as the block finals. The winner of this will go through to the finals. And honestly, Matt, I will be amazed if anyone had these two at the top of Blue Block. Seven up going to 11 points, defeating BMI 2000 at 10 points with the refrigerator bomb in 13 minutes and 31 seconds. Um, before we sort of talk about them winning the block, uh, I really enjoyed all the host stuff between all four women. And I actually thought Nene gave Ruaka a lot in this match. Like she had the avalanche fisherman suplex, um, she managed to get her up for the fisherman suplex as well, the deadlift one, which I thought was really cool. Um, and then, of course, we had the swanton and um, the freezer bomb spot where Nene's then angered by the fact that Ruaka is using her own move against her, hits her with two, and that's the win. If we're talking about it as in terms of that, I thought this was a really good match, Matt. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, but my heart was kind of sunk in my chest just because. I realized we weren't getting uh, Mike and Himika, who a lot of uh, we were just kind of, we were pretty you know pretty confident that they were going to make it to at least the finals, and that we were getting an outside team. Um, you know, either either we were getting BMI two thousand or Seven Up, the outside team going to the finals, kind of scratching your head. But 
yeah, the match was really good. You know, I kind of was uh, bagging on you for her lack of selling. Just how you talked about Ruaka got a lot. Uh, Nanei Takahashi gave Ruaka a lot. Um, Tor, or excuse me, uh, you sold very well for Tor in this match. Mm. And I just don't know if she's just maybe selling for, just only for the wrestlers that can kind of keep up with her with the strikes and the heavy hitters mm. um, or whatnot. But yeah, I thought the match was really good. It was just the crowd just felt so deflated. Um, so it was like there was next to no crowd reaction. But all four ladies worked hard and they worked pretty well. So uh, I had it three and a quarter stars. This this match was pretty much played out in complete silence. Um, the Chiba crowd, despite you being from Chiba, um, it was it was not it was not received well. Um, and then it was the win for Seven Up was greeted with just tumbleweeds like there was no clapping there was no there was no noise from the crowd at all it was really awkward and that was only going to get worse as um when we got to the final and there was a couple of bits of this match that irked me you know Nene Takashi fighting off all of her tie single-handedly no selling a lead to pipe shot to the back <laughs> We, in front of the ref too. In front Ivan, of the Ivan, ref. Ivan, oh, no. Ivan parentheses. How is this not a disqualification? So it's like as if I wasn't further further deflated. I was like, I, you know, we go on this podcast all the time when it comes to these tag matches that when there's interference and the ref isn't properly blinded, I'm like, what are you doing? It's you're now you're putting the heat on the ref. But continue. Sorry. No, it's fine because at the start of the match, Rena was distracting the ref which I don't understand because then they just sort of gave up on that and just literally had all of a wet I storm the ring. But it doesn't matter because Nene is superwoman and could fight them all. I hate when people do that. It was one of those things that I hated about Hulk Hogan back in the day when he'd fight off an entire stable and then they'd wonder why the heels, like nobody cared about them. It just, it really irked me. And the fact that the finish came as a result of that. And then there was the silence that greeted the victory. It was all very, very, very awkward. Um, especially when you think, right. So seven up are in the final. Right. Well, it sort of makes you think, right. Well, who are they going to go up against and who's going to win? Because I don't think we pegged anyone in red block to win the thing because, Mafia Bella weren't going to win it because Julie's already in a match. Um, Karate Brave weren't going to win it because Siri's already in a match. Um, My Fair Lady were already eliminated. We Love Tokyo Sports already eliminated. Peach Rock were already eliminated. Basically, the only three teams that could legitimately win it were Black Desire, Aphrodite, and Meltier. You weren't going to do Meltier because you're not going to have the champions fight the number one contender and then fight them again because that makes no sense. It's not going to be Aphrodite, because Saya Kamatani is going to be wrestling at Ryogoku, which leaves Black Desire, who also can't get through. So it was literally between Aphrodite and Meltier. Meltier. And I, I literally tweeted out maybe about 20 minutes after this match, after the internet went nuts. And I was like, you know what? They have a big show to sell on the third. And only about a week's time between that and the big show on the 29th. And I literally tweeted out and convinced myself and a few other people on Twitter, and thank you for giving me hope, that Aphrodite was going to... I'm like, no way. They're going to end this thing on a high note. Aphrodite is going to win this tournament. It's going to give Sai Kamatani more steam going into the 29th and Utami more steam going up in the 29th against a match with Kyrie. And their tag title match is going to take place on the 3rd. They can put... you know, Mike and Himika, Mariah Ami, sorry. Doesn't matter in that tag title match on the 29th, put a team that had the most points but didn't go through and just say Aphrodite, they're already busy, but they're going to get their title shot on the third. And that's your main event for that third, which will probably be a pay-per-view. I put that tweeted out. I had it set in my mind that that's what wasn't going to ha- That's what was going to happen. Obviously it didn't. Um, Cause I was like, there's no way that they're going to put Nene Takahashi and seven up who, who were not, I don't think we're ever a team before even coming to stardom. In the most stacked year Sardom's ever had, they're going to have him win and close out this pay-per-view. And I literally convinced myself that that wasn't going to happen. And I didn't get that bike for Christmas, Rob. I didn't. <laughs> I thought I was going to get that, you know, Red Rider BB gun and that, you know, new Huffy sports bike for Christmas. I was a good boy all year. I didn't get it. <laughs> nah, man, you didn't. Um, it's, <sighs> yeah, it was, uh, 
this this tournament we'll talk, ended well, yeah. in very very uh very head scratching not, circumstances not not like the five star where we're all like julia's the biggest star in wrestling stardom's going to the top this was the best tournament ever this was the pay-per-view of the year every match was great tam was great look at the entrances oh my god stardom's the best i mean <laughs> yeah. so i mean tag league to be fair it's always been it's it's always been sort of the red-headed stepchild of you know for lack of a better phrase of of the tournaments like it's the one where not no one really cares about it, but the booking's always been, for lack of a better phrase, in inoff- like inoffensive. Like the team yeah, who's won yeah. it, you've always been like, oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, but yeah. here you yeah, had at- a couple of different ways you could have gone. I wouldn't have hated FWC game back to back. Um, no, you no, know, but like you look at you look again. Look at the winners you've had the last three years. You know, last year you had FWC. Everybody loves them. The year before 2020, you had Momo AZ. Everybody loves them. The year before 2019, you had uh, Tam and Arissa. So you've Shine. always had like, yeah, Dream Shine. You've had the, yay, this was this was great. Solid tournament. We, we love the winners. And you get that pop at the end where it was like, okay, the final was a great match. But like, what? We'll get, and we'll get there. We'll get Sorry, it. folks. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> match five then. First match of Red Block. Saw Karate Brave move to nine points, defeating My Fair Lady, who ends the tournament with a big duck egg. Zero. Um, Siori pinning Lady C with the buzzsaw kick in nine minutes and seven seconds. Um, uh, this was, in a word, fine. Um, there was literally no stakes whatsoever. And it was it was fine. It was a fine opener to Red Block, Matt. Rob, how do you know there was no stakes involved? You didn't think anybody had a stake after this match? Is that what you do you have do you know what restaurant they go to? Uh, we've got <laughs> our inside sources, my man. <laughs> yeah, this was really good. I was uh yeah, this was it was fine. It was good. Um again, it's just so funny how it seemed like Micah or my Sakurai and Lady C after the first match, I'm like, oh, this tournament with them, it's gonna be something different. Just gonna be the two of them not getting along. And they just been double teaming and double teaming and double teaming like they're like Tully and Iron. And then that really cool double team spot where uh, I know you hate my Sakurai's top rope elbow, but it's pretty cool how they do uh, the where uh, Lady C has the Cobra Crotch um, backbreaker and the, their opponent's kind of you know laying there vertically on Lady C's knee, and then May Sakurai comes out with the uh, from the top rope or the second rope with the elbow. So I thought that was pretty cool, but it just it is funny to me. It's like, this is clearly where they're going. And two matches later, it's like, nope, we're hard tag team moves are as good as any team out there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was really fun. And I just, I'm such a huge fan of Tomoka Inaba, especially the way that she does her striking. And she's like very much like a counter striker. Mm-hmm. I noticed towards the tail end of this tournament when she's in like a striking fest with somebody, she'll like, she'll bait somebody in and throwing like a right hand or like a right forearm. And she'll duck and she'll hit them with like a rib shot or a kidney shot. And the person just double overs in pain and it gives enough time for that person to sell and register with the fans. And by the time that register is over, she just kicks you right in the face. So it's like, <laughs> Oh my goodness. Like, again, I don't think Sherry, I don't think Sherry's the, the stiffest striker in this tag team. <laughs> like I think Tomoka Inaba had a lot to prove in this tournament and boy, howdy did she. Um, but I thought uh, Karate Brave looked great here. I thought they were fantastic in this tournament. I had this one at three and a quarter stars. Exactly the same as me. Um, so us. Oh, we're just such a team. <laughs> um, match six then. So another red block match. Peach Rock close out the tournament with a victory, moving to six points, defeating the We Love Tokyo sports team of Saki and Fuking and Death, who end on four points with Mayu Ibutani reversing the Kishikasai in five minutes and 57 seconds. Now, at the start of this match, Momo Kogo comes down with things like she's got like a, a panel or a paddle and some glow sticks. And she's got her hair tied up like this headband. And she's so gesturing to Saki Kashima and starts this dance. And I sat there and going, what the hell is going on here? Um, and I messaged you, and you were like, "Rob, I've got no idea what you're on about." Oh, now you I know, and I know why. <laughs> yeah, now, I, yeah, now, now I understand why, and it's because of Velkage on our Discord, who is literally a font of knowledge um, when it comes to this sort of thing. So I put on Discord, "What the hell is going on? 
what is what is happening so this comes from velkage who says momokogo is a big fan of the orisa tam mayu and saki era of stars <laughs> he's pointing capital s big fan um and she wants to bring saki back to the light for her to be all sparkly and bright once again that's what she tried from the start that's why she wanted to be with mayu and is a reason why she refused the cosmic angels offer when she joined she gave up on trying to get tam back but she wants to bring the clown back as well because she is no longer good and sparkly <laughs> Um, during the year her attachment to that era turned kind of creepy because Saki Kashima is calling her fans dirty nerds probably best translation is simps and she tells them to run to ATMs to buy her stuff basically kind of it um, and then Momokogo plays along with it that's why she was willing to get that photo book from Saki in the five star and that ah. explains why her latest thing is being outfitted in this idle attacku gear with the headband and the lights and doing the idle call and response routine which apparently according to Valkage, is comically exaggerated so that explains what the hell was going on with momo Kogo in this match map okay yeah i didn't see it i was actually getting ready for church however watch this rap this is ah uh, this is gonna be so good so you're telling me that momo Kogo is a big fan of when saki kashima was in stars correct Okay, so if you folks want to learn more about that, subscribe to our Patreon because in the next week, Merry Mayu Christmas, I'm reviewing all five title matches with Mayu Iwatani teaming with Saki Kashima. How about that? You you gave me, you pitched me a softball and didn't even know. What a setup, folks. Honestly, yeah, that's you smash you, it out of the ground, my friend. <laughs> unbelievable yeah you texted me a few hours ago you're like what's going on with momo and saki i think I, my first response is okay which momo <laughs> which saki? you are going to have to be like, considerably <laughs> more specific <laughs> I, I literally went to my hair momo as much as i love momo kogo momo watanabe she that's she's my jam but i was like what do you, which which ones and then you told me which ones they were so what are you talking about like the tag league final and i'm like i had so much going on in the last week i'm like i kind of forgot and then i literally had my notebook and i was going through i'm like oh this match had next to no stakes. I needed to find a 20-minute window where I can have a protein shake, take a shower, shave, and so this way I'm ready for church as soon as the tag league was over. So I only caught the tail end of this match. Um, so now I know why. <laughs> there you go. Now, in fairness, the match itself is is fine, um, but it was more about this angle. And then <laughs> post-match, Mayu just kicks her, just kicks Momo Kogo, slaps her on the head, is probably had enough. Um, and to be honest, if I was Mayu, I'd have kicked her as well um, for her terrible dance. But Wow, you're um, so mean today. <laughs> um, Shigio on Twitter, again, who is fantastic for translations, go and follow them, at SG underscore OXXT on Twitter. Um, the post-match uh, between Mayu and Momo Kogo, Mayu says, I now understand, sorry, I now understand why Hazuki gave up on you talking to Momo Kogo. You are limiting your own potential. You should reflect on yourself and then walks off. What a jerk. <laughs> savage. <laughs> Jesus. You, call her you may as well call her Randy because she's savage. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's that uh, It's that picture, isn't it, of, of Sid Vicious and uh, Randy Savage. It's not just Vicious, it's downright savage. Um, yeah, that it was, wow. So Mayu pulling no punches with Momo Kogo there. Wow, unbelievable. <laughs> um, I'll be perfectly honest, I can't remember anything about the match because it was all about this angle, which I thought was quite funny. Um, but both these teams were eliminated anyway prior to the opening of play. Anyway, match seven, Goddess of Storm Tagli red block match. Black Desire defeating Mafia Bella, Black Desire moving to nine points, Mafia Bella staying on eight points. Starlight Kid pinning Tekla with the Black tiger pile driver in eight minutes and 22 seconds matt here comes what did you think this was completely different than the last match wasn't it as soon as the bell rang these God, four yes. teams started throwing bombs started mm -hmm. throwing bombs to the point where julia i watched this match twice and trying to figure out where she got cut open i think from a forearm like maybe the tip of the elbow from something from momo watanabe and accidents happen then these two just start dropping each other on their heads and then it's like well okay if you haven't seen enough violence we're going to tag out to Starlight Kid and Tekla, who they do a mini high-speed 
uh, match. And then uh, we get some double team moves. And then Starlight Kid does the combination of hitting the moonsault. And then uh, obviously Tekla k- kicks out and she hits the Black Tiger pile driver for the win. We don't see her winning enough matches with that move. I think that's kind of like her nuclear finish, which we've seen a lot of people kick out of it in the last year or so, which I, I, I don't like. But I was a big fan of this match. Uh, to me, just too short. I had it at three and a half stars. And I think if they gave it two or three more extra minutes, it would have got closer to the five stars. But obviously all four of these ladies have fantastic chemistry. I think we're going to see in 2023, uh, Mama Watanabe challenging Julia for the red belt, just based on their, um, her loss in the five star to Momo. And uh, we got a little bit of a preview here. And uh, I thought that Tekla and Starlight Kid had some really, really good chemistry. There's some really, really good, really good spots there. And obviously the double teams from both these teams, especially Momo and Starlight Kid, were absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I gave it three and three quarters. Again, most of these matches did not go long at all. In fact, on the night, there was only um, one, two, um, and th- there's only three matches that went above 10 minutes, one of them only by 18 seconds, and the final went 20. So they rattled through all of these matches, and obviously there was only a 15-minute time limit on these matches as well. These four women do tremendously well when they're together. When Tekla first debuted, um, her best exchanges were with Starlight Kid and Mayu, so I'm not surprised that that's continued. And actually... On the back of that, uh, we have a Tekla and Starlight Kid singles match announced for the 10th of December on the year-end tour at the Eddie and Arena Osaka 2. So we will get to see that play out. Hopefully, if you give them 10 minutes in a singles match, they will be able to pawn an absolute barn burner. Um, Moving on then, we go to our semi-main, which of course acts as our red block uh, final. Uh, it was Aphrodite moving to 10 points, defeating Meltia, who stay on 10 points, with Sayakamatani landing a picture perfect Firebird splash on Natsupoi in 9 minutes and 17 seconds. Another fantastic outing for both teams, Matt. Yeah, and I thought how it, the psychology of the match with Sai and Yutami were very adamant, were we need to win this match and we need to win it quick because we're up next. There's no other matches. There's no big break. There's nothing here. So like right out the start, they started out fast. They need, they want to try to end this match quick. But then after that psychology and that storyline sets in, it's like, wait a minute, Meltier obviously needs to win as well. Um, if they want to go to the finals, cause they're sitting on 10 points, obviously Sai Utami would win the tiebreaker, which they do. But the, uh, but they're the tag champs. So then they wind up cutting off uh, uh, Aphrodite and they start building up their double team spots. So it was like almost a sprint with this match. Again, it went under 10 minutes. I would love to see these two teams have a proper, maybe 15, 20 minute match. Maybe because Sai and Utami did beat the tag champs. Maybe that's somewhere down the line where we might get, uh, you know, a longer match. And again, we may get it on the pay-per-view on the, on the third, you know, you need a quick sell a pay-per-view. You put Aphrodite versus Meltier for the uh, tag belts on as the main event. I think that's a, a proper way, you know, to, uh, to to sell that show. But yeah, the, the, these two teams were fantastic. Everything was on point. Um, I like how uh, Sai Kamatani would keep trying to go in for the Star Crusher. Um, and then the one time when she went up, when she went, uh, she went to go put, put a Natsupoi down on the bump that Natsupoi was able to counter with a ferial blink and everybody bit for that. Uh, they did a good job, you know, basically taking the crowd on an emotional roller coaster. but ultimately it's the, just the fantastic, the way that Sai and Utami, not only as singles wrestlers, but as tag wrestlers build their finish where it's just one thing after another, after another, but like spacing it out with good timing and putting psychology and selling in. And the way that they do it as a tag team in this whole tournament, completely blown away about how great Aphrodite is. It's like, well, no, duh. You have Utami, the wrestler of the year last year, and Sayakama Tani, the wrestler there this year. Why wouldn't they be good together? We just ha- didn't get a chance to see them uh, much as a tag team this year because just Sai is just so busy with the white belt. But the way that they built their matches in this tournament towards the end were absolutely flawless. Um, and the way that they built towards everything, towards the 450, the Firebird Splash, I thought was just just fantastic. And Aphrodite just had such a great tournament. I had this one at four stars. Yep, same here, flat four. Um, Aphrodite, again, have proved time and time and time again how good they are. Um, I think 
were saying not the white belt champion, they'd have won the tag league. Um, and rightly so. Um, Meltier, fantastic team, but again, they're not going to win with them being champions. Um, especially when you've got lots of other teams to pit them against. Um, overall, same with me, flat four stars. I could watch these two teams wrestle for considerably longer and enjoy it massively. Hopefully, this will set up a match should Meltier retain at Rio Goku, which, fingers crossed. Um, match nine, then. Our final of the Stardom Tag League 2022. Seven up, the blue block winners defeated Aphrodite, the red block winners, when you hit the last ride on to Sayakamatani in 20 minutes and eight seconds. Now, before we go all negative, Matt, let's focus on the match because the match itself, those 20 minutes and eight seconds in the ring, were brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. This was was great. This match was fantastic. Again, earlier on in previous podcasts, I kind of bag on you selling. Her selling, especially for you, Tommy, was really, really spot on, which is, is makes it actually even more frustrating, the fact that she can sell in, in proper spots. She just sometimes chooses not to. And maybe that's her gimmick. I don't know. I've never seen her wrestle outside of, you know, these stardom shows. But, like, the finishing stretches she did with Utami and just the double teams that Utami and Sayakamatani had to do to kind of get her down. And even, like, the the way the match built towards the beginning where you kind of have the more powerhouse team of 7-Up. Um, you know, obviously, Utami's a powerhouse in her own right. But the way for Sayakamatani to get the advantage was I'm just going to use my high-speed, high fe- uh, high-paced high offense to get the advantage. And then you would see Aphrodite with double-team, double-team, double-team. And then eventually, you starts to slow down the momentum of Sayakamatani, basically working on the back. And then we see that fake dive that she was going for in the tournament where she kind of looks like she's going to dive. And then she just falls down and kind of just rolls on top of everybody. So it's just like she goes for that and then she misses. The only time she misses with it. And then Sayakamatani fires up with it. She hits the Nene Takahashi with the springboard drop kick and then hits the springboard plancha on the outside. So I thought that was cool how you miss the fake dive spot that uh that she she hits that she's been hitting on every match she went for on the tournament. And then Saya basically pops the crowd with two big springboard moves back to back. I thought that was uh, really, really cool. And then as Saya starts building more momentum. You gets back in the ring and just drills her with this crazy Larry. And then there's like the John Tenta earthquake style splash right on poor Sayakamatani's chest. I don't know how she protected her on that one because that one looks like it hurt. Um, and then you goes to the top rope to go for that splash. And then Saya does that thing where she bridges and she fires up like a phoenix, pun intended. It was actually made it on the cover of uh, Weekly Pro Wrestling Magazine with her match with Suzu Suzuki from uh, the Five Star. Um but and then the match just keeps building from there, and you don't know wh- which way it's gonna go. Because again, I had it convinced in my head that I'm like, there's no way that they're gonna. Ha- it's got to be Sai and Utami. And the way the match is building towards the end, and how Aphrodite has been building all their big tag wins was exactly the way they were building it here. And I'm like, it's definitely gonna be them. It's definitely gonna be them. And then Sai goes for the Phoenix. She goes to the top rope, Rob, for the Phoenix Bird Splash. And it felt like it took forever to get up there. I'm like, come on, Saya, get up there, <laughs> hit it, hit it. And she just takes way too long. And then she, uh, and she misses. And then they go for uh seven up, go for, they go for the T gimmick, the old, uh, uh, backseat boys from CZW from a uh, professional wrestling independent fame, which they won a few matches with. They go for the T gimmick and, uh, that gets countered. And then, uh, Saya accidentally hits you, Tommy. And then we get some big double team moves this, uh, from seven up and you see the tide starting to turn and my heart starts to sink, um, into my stomach. And then you, you see that, uh, you's going for the last ride. And I'm like, Oh no, here it comes. And then Sai is able to counter with the her karana and then properly hooks the leg and the ref did such a perfect job of looking at the shoulders counting and gets to 2.999 i bit so hard on that fallacy because i thought to myself what a finish what a finish they're building all this momentum back to seven up use going for that last ride par, par, uh, power bomb that she almost killed poor walker with the week before <laughs> and saya is able to counter with this i'm like oh what a, just a great crowning achievement this is going to be for saya and uh, in just a phenomenal year but then she winds up kicking out she hit get, she gets hit with the uh the t gimmick and uh utami can't make the, or sorry she gets hit with the t gimmick and i thought okay this is going to be the finish but utami 
Great job by the camera. You don't see Utami coming at all until the last second. Utami makes the save. My heart goes back into my stomach. I'm, I think this is going to be the momentum. Something's going to happen. Aphrodite's going to hit a whole bunch of double teams to finish this off. But ultimately, Nene Takahashi, she hits uh, Utami, I think, with like the sliding, uh, the sliding D right into the face. I'm like, oh, that's a singles match I definitely want to see somewhere. Basically taking uh, Utami out for the rest of the match. And then you then hits that thunderous last ride powerbomb. And I was like, come on, Utami, you got to come in and make the save. She does it. The three count hits. I cried. You cried. The internet cried, Rob. However, this match was an absolute masterpiece. Whether you disagree with who won this match, who won the finals, you cannot discredit how phenomenal this match was. And as great as Aphrodite is and was in this match, you and Nene Takahashi were just as good. Mm -hmm. These two teams gelled so well together, and they gave them 20 minutes. This was fantastic. I had this at four and a half stars. Yeah, four and a quarter myself. I um, completely agree with everything you've said there, Matt. Um, you can say that Aphrodite are a fantastic tag team, fantastic in ring, but you're absolutely right. You and Nene Takahashi bought it here, and it really did feel like a huge match, really, really hard hitting offense. That that there was a moment where Nene and Utami just literally sat in the middle of the ring, slapping the hell out of each other, and I loved it absolutely loved it it felt like a really really good match until the moment the bell rang and that's such a shame but before we get into our thoughts on that a couple of things matt i know you love a stat i know you love my stats so got a little and bit i of... love you giving the stats sir so you give it to me sir now a little bit of a quiz nene takahashi Ooh. obviously wins the tag league alongside you she becomes the fourth person to win the tournament twice who are the other three can i cheat because i literally have your book right here you cannot <laughs> cheat using living the dream you okay cannot. i am okay i'm literally taking this i'm sliding it next to lily's sonic the hedgehog pop so okay so there's <laughs> been what was the question again there's been four people that have won the tournament twice yes with different partners mm, okay momo watanabe mm-hmm. um eo eo's only won it once okay um, she only won it once with Mayu. So, is it Mayu? No, it's not Mayu. Um, I'm see three more. Kyrie. Kyrie has won it with Nene, yeah. and she won it with the next person. Yoko Bito. Yoko Bito. Yoko Bito. Yeah. Yoko Bito's won it twice. There you go. Who do, so, Yoko, who do, Yoko, who do Yoko Bito win, uh, win with? She won the inaugural one, I believe, with Yuzuki Aikawa. Oh, so the so the answer is uh. Nene, Momo, Yoko Bito, and Kyrie. Correct. Ah, look at that. I and I got I didn't even really use your book. There I was you going go. to. I was gonna I was gonna cheat like I was in the tenth grade. <laughs> uh Nene has won it obviously with you, and then she won it with Kyrie. Kyrie's won it with Nene and Yoko Bito. Yoko Bito's won it with Kyrie and with Yuzuki Aikawa, and then Momo's won it with Azumi and Utami. Um we then get and we'll talk about our feelings of the match after we've gone through this. Um, Nene and you then call out uh, Meltia, the tag champs. Meltia come down and start singing at, at Nene, um, which is hilarious. Um, the song that they sing is apparently called Baku Baku Kiss and was performed by Kiss no Sakai, an idol unit in all Japan's women's pro wrestling that consisted of Nene Takahashi, Momo Nakanishi, Miho Wakizawa, and Kayo Numi. So basically, Meltia start mocking Nene. Nene does not enjoy it, though she does initially start dancing until you stop, so which is really quite funny um and basically they make it official that at rio goku our goddess of storm tag match is going to be meltia versus seven up um meltia leave the ring still singing and dancing which is really funny because you's like stop it um and yeah that's that's our final um oh it has not gone down well on the internet map no, here's another problem that you have, right? So you have the crowning of 
your winners of this tournament. You have the rings, you have the confetti, you have all this stuff. They just had this phenomenal match. You can't take it away from them. And their match with BMI 2000 was really good as well. They just had this phenomenal match. Uh, my match of the tournament, obviously, we're going to get into our, our top picks in a moment here. Absolute and silence. literally, the champs are just walking out of the building. They're literally, they did their soul song and dance. They're literally yeah. walking out of the building. And the entire, not the entire crowd, maybe the entire crowd, they're not watching this celebration in the ring. They're just watching Tam and Nasapoy leave the ring. It's not like they're doing jumping jacks or back, but they might have been, I think they skipped like once or twice, but they're literally doing nothing but just walking back to the curtain and nobody's watching 7-Up. Everybody's just watching Natsupoy and Tam leave the building. What does that tell you? Do this entire segment... So from the moment, and not just because they cut the audio because they haven't got the rights to it, from the moment the bell rings to the moment that the confetti comes down, and we're talking probably 10 minutes, it is silent in the arena. Like, Seven Up have to work so hard to get any sort of reaction from the crowd, and I'm it is so uncomfortable to watch and even meltier when they come down have really got to work to try and get the crowd motivated because it is like they've let the air out of the arena with this choice of victor and you know you've got these people who have held stardom up during this incredibly difficult time you know with covid and everything like that you've got 30 or so wrestlers on the roster but the moment you can bring in other people, they're winning a tournament. And it just seemed like you could have given it to the new eras. I know you weren't going to because Mariah's already won the Cinderella, but you could have given it to them. Could have given it to Black Desire. Could have given it to Aphrodite. Could have given it to My Himmy. There were so many options there, and it's it's a really puzzling choice that you have chosen 7-Up. And it's a choice that ultimately has been greeted not just negatively on the internet, because you can't judge everything by the internet, because the internet, people on the internet aren't real. Um, but in the arena, like, the arena shows you, like, stardom will, stardom fans will clap everything, clap anything. They just were not interested at all from the moment that final bell rang at all, where they met. And the fact that the match was so good. I know. And I literally got no reaction. That just goes to show that you're not over. That you're not over to a certain degree. So we knew that going into this tournament, okay, we're and then you're looking at as the card for uh Sumo Hall is coming up. You know, okay, you're Tam and Natsupoy are gonna defend the belts. It's the biggest show of the year. Tam and Natsupoy, they're big stars for the company. Mike and Himika to me is just, you know, we're looking at that. I'm like, that's they're hitting home run. The booking this year, I talk about it all the time. This is one of the greatest single years ever for any company in the history of pro wrestling. And they're just knocking it out of the park with the booking. And then it's like, how did we miss? How did we miss this? And the only thing I can think of as the card is, and then we'll get into it, as the card is announced outside of the uh, Sherry versus Julia match, all the title, all the other title matches are stardom versus the world. So maybe. The booking is like, we're just going to show you how good stardom is by winning all the matches against the outsiders. And then we're going to give you the fan, which, which it's obviously going to be a fantastic main event with Julie and, and, and Sherry. But another thing, it's like, yeah, exactly. You you have all these wrestlers that have just been kicking ass all year. And not one of them wins. It goes to the outsiders. Again, I thought Nene Takahashi and you, they were great in this match. I thought they had a really solid tournament. Their match with Meltier, if you decides to sell, I think is going to be fantastic. But the fact that Tam and Nasapoy are not the heavy hitters that a Micah, a Himika, or a Utami are, is she going to be giving them anything? And the fact that it's a title match, you totally kill your drama when you're not selling, getting especially building towards the end of the match. I thought Nene Takahashi, this tournament was unbelievable. I thought she was great. I thought she she gave all the young, younger wrestlers more than she needed to. She's a legend of the sport, you know, former red belt champion. I thought she was fantastic. But at the same time, when you're, if you're not over, you're just not over. 
And when when you had this match be this good, and when the bell rings, you're like, what? And then you're bringing out your champions who obviously are over, and like nobody cared. Nobody cared, even to the point where it's like, what do I watch this fancy celebration? Or am I watching Tim and not support just walk out of the building? And that's what everybody did. I I I don't understand the booking here, especially when the booking has been so unbelievable and we've been so spoiled with how great stardom has been, not just this year, but really the last few years. But then then it's like, we get this man. It's a head scratcher. It really, really is. So obviously we'll see what happens uh, come the 29th. I think the match will be really, really good, but I think it would be a lot better if you had Mike and him. And I'm not just saying that because that was our picks. I just think that would be the way to go. I to me that's just the bigger match because Mike and Himika are over. They're over by they're in Donald Del Mondo. The whole faction's been over for two years. I just think that would be that that would be the way to go. I, I was going to save this till we talked about the um, the card for the Dream Queendom, but you've just mentioned that you know all of the title matches aside from Suri and Julia are outsiders. Altogether on this card so far, there are seven people who don't work full time for Stardom, and that's not including you, Nagi, who's also working the show. Five of them are working title matches. So, High Speed Championship, Artist of Stardom, Goddess of Stardom, Wonder of Stardom are all being competed for by people who are not full time on the Stardom roster. Now, to me, the year. to me, that is. That's it. nonsensical. It's slapping the face to everybody else in the roster. You work your ass off all year. I've had friends of mine that have worked for the big WWE Impact, yada yada yada. And basically, the mindset is: obviously, you want to go out there and work your ass off all the time to give the fans their money's worth. But the ultimate thing is, it's like Christmas. You're good all year because you want that Huffy bike, that Red Rider BB gun, that Super Nintendo, whatever. And when the roster's this good all year. And it's like, well, no, Mayu's not going to get a title match. Hazuki's not going to get a title match. Mike and Himika, they're not going to get a title match. But all these other people, we're just going to, you know, bring them in. Like, at least with, with Seven Up, you built them. You built them up in this tournament. So, okay, I get that. But like, the high speed match and the white belt match, it's like, there's no, there's no build. Like, why are they getting rewarded and nobody else is? It, are these matches going to be good? Absolutely. Is the card going to be stellar? I don't see how it's not going to be. But to me, it's like. That's kind of killing your employee morale a little bit. Again, that's just that's just me. I don't think it is just you, Matt. That's the problem. Um, we'll we'll leave our awards until the end because I'm very conscious that I want to end on a positive. Um, yes. So let's leave our awards till the end, and we'll talk a little bit more about these cards and break them down. So before I do that, I just need to take a moment to talk about how utterly insane the press conference was. Now, you'd got Mina making her return in full bandages, selling the injuries from Sire, looking like DC's hush. Um, Mayu taking a full 20 seconds to try and fail to pronounce Ria Goku. Shimizu sprinting across Azumi's speech, just screaming. And Yutami putting up a wager that the loser of the match between her and Kairi needs to revert back to factory settings and wrestle in their debut gimmick. And then Waka having to be carried from the stage, fireman's lift, after she attempts to fight Ram Kachow. It was an hour of utter insanity. And I know it's not subtitled, but I actively encourage you to go and watch it on YouTube because honestly, you will look at it and go, what is happening? Um, the whole point of it, though, was to announce the cards for New Blood 6 and for Star and Dream Queendom. Let's delve straight into the main event. So the card for Star and Dream Queendom from Sumo Hall, 29th of December, which will be, by the way, Matt, Stardom's 23rd pay-per-view of the year. There it is. He got it, buddy. Michael Jordan, 23. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure I've missed one of the five-star dates, but I've got the number 23 if you include Dream Queendom. Um, the Stardom Rumble, which, of uh, course, participants are to be announced. We've then got um, Mina Shirakawa returning, reuniting with Yunagi Sayaka, Pink Kabuki versus Tekla and Mei Sakurai. We've then got a triangle derby preview with the team of Mayu Iwatani, Momokogo, and Hanan taking on FWC and Saya Edith. Um, 
we've got a number one contendership for the Goddess of Storm titles, My Himmy versus New Era versus BMI 2000. Um, you've then got the singles match between Kairi and Utami Hayashista. Um, and then we've got a run of title matches, the High Speed Championship, Azumi versus Sakari Shimizu, Oeditai versus Prominence for the Artist of Stardom Championship in a hardcore match, Prominence being represented by Risa Sarah, Suzu Suzuki, and Kurumi Hiragi. Um, the aforementioned Meltia versus Seven Up match um, for the Goddess of Stardom tag titles, the Wonder of Stardom match, Sayaka Matani versus Haruka Yumasaki, and the World of Stardom Championship match, Shuri versus Julia. So again, I know I mentioned it before, not including the Stardom Rumble, which presumably is going to see a lot more people. There are seven people who don't work full-time for Stardom, not including Yunagi or Kairi, with five working title matches in what many are calling the biggest show of the year. And I don't know whether we're just overhyping the importance of this show. Maybe we are. But on this show, there is nothing for Mayu, nothing for Hazuki, Micah, Himika, Mirai. And there's absolutely no word on what's happening with the SWA belt. Are you telling me that we couldn't do... So, at the moment, My Himmy versus the New Eras versus BMI 2000s are number one contendership match. My Himmy are winning that, I guarantee it. Ooh, that means it's not happening because I, I would have pegged the same thing and then they're going to challenge for that uh, melt here for that show on the third. I just think there's going to be a big not? title match on the show for the... Yeah. But why so not I agree have... with you, so it's not going to happen. Well, yeah, that's true. But why <laughs> not have My Himmy against Meltier here on this show, give them the showcase, and then have Seven Up win the number one contendership and challenge afterwards? Ding, 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 ding. What? I agree with you. I don't have that answer because I agree with you. Why Why would you not give Micah and Himika the spotlight at Sumo Hall? It makes no sense. Um, You could have had any number. I mean, no disrespect to Umasaki at all because I am sure that that match is going to be incredible. But Hazuki is sitting in a triangle derby preview match doing nothing. Mirai is doing nothing. The spotlight that you've put on Mirai this year, and she's doing nothing. She's second from the bottom of the card. Third from bottom, sorry. And I know that you can argue, oh, well, they're in a number one contendership match. It's not the fact. It's not where they are in the standings that I'm bothered about. It's the fact that they are not featured properly on this card. Why, why are we not? featuring this talent that has got us to the point where we're able to run Sumo Hall. Because no disrespect to Nene Takahashi and you, it wasn't on the back of their work. It wasn't on the back of Colours. It wasn't on the back of Prominence, even though I am really excited to see a weather type versus Prominence. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, there are lots of tweaks that I feel that you can put to this card to make it considerably stronger. Am I disappointed in the card? Yeah, I, I can't lie. Yes, I am. Kyrie versus Utami is going to slap. Suri versus Julia is going to be incredible. Oedo Tai versus Prominence in a hardcore match is going to be car crash fun. I'm, I'm sure that the All-Stars Triangle Derby preview is going to be fine. I can't wait to see Mina Shirakawa again. It's going to be great to see Pink and Boots in the opener. In, in the, the opener. Over, in the exactly. Opener. Yeah. Just think how that's going to get everyone going. No, <laughs> oh, oh, because you're going to break your foot again, buddy. Oh, Let's yeah. take it easy. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be doing no such movement. You know, Suri versus Julia. Oh, my God. But it just feels like there is a lot of filler in the middle of this card, considering the emphasis they put on this show, Matt. It feels like outside of the main event, Shuri versus uh, Julia and Utami versus Kyrie. It kind of just seems like, okay, this would be a good pay-per-view for somewhere, you know, in the stardom X stardom or somewhere in the middle. But exactly. like, again, this, this is what you build towards this year. And I can't emphasize how absolutely amazing the start. Nobody flies, maybe you, but nobody flies the stardom banner higher than me. I absolutely love, love, love this company. Inject it into my veins. I literally yell at people. How come you're not watching Stardom? I pushed an old lady the other day at the grocery store. I said, watch Stardom. No, that didn't happen. But anywho, but when you're looking at this card, yeah, you're. I'm sure all these matches are going to be great. I'm sure that when we reviewed this show, that we may say it's one of, if not the best, overall shows in all of wrestling of the year. But 
yeah, like Yumasaki against Saya, I think I've seen maybe one or two of her matches. And now I, you know, it gives me a little bit of homework to do between now and then. But it's like, yeah, why don't you have Huzuki there? Or why not be like, put Mayu there and be like, you know, we're, if we're going to really crown Saya Kamatani as this all time white belt champion, a clean 22 minute win in the semi main event over the icon of stardom. What a better way to end the year for Saya Kamatani, right? Like over, you know, we, we, we couldn't do that. Like maybe it's somewhere where I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because it's the end of the year show. And I could be wrong. There's only one title changer. I don't, maybe prominence is an outside shot that they win the artist. But other than that, I don't see Azumi losing. I don't see, I surely don't see Saya Kamatani losing. I think maybe it's just like, well, we want to put the focus really on Shuri and Julia. At the same time, if this show was just Shuri versus Julia and Utami versus Kyrie, people are still going to buy it. People are still going to show up. But we live in a world now where we're so spoiled that we're the, all these wrestling cars and all these companies, they really need to be, you know, pretty well stacked. And it's a little bit disappointing, but I still think the show is going to be awesome. Even like the, you basically have a preview of the Triangle Derby with the stars versus the stars. And I'm kind of glad that they kind of split up the all-star teams because I was like, well, they're going to put all the main eventers, you know, FWC and Mayu on one side, and then the younger, you know, Momokogo, uh, Hana, and Saida on the other. And they didn't. I'm kind of glad they split that up. I hope they don't do that with Queen's Quest. I just, I really want to see uh, Saya Kamatani, Yutami, and Azumi as a team. But that's, you know, another story for another another day. But, uh, yeah, for how well this company has built Going towards the end of the year, you're bookending this monumental year where they're the second biggest wrestling company in Japan and the fourth biggest wrestling company in the world, and they only wrestle in Japan, and it's only females. And here's our big show of the year. Here's our WrestleMania. Here's our Starcade. Here's our Super Bowl. And it's like, oh, really? Like, this is your grand finale? That's like the, the MCU. They built the MCU up for 10, 11 years to get to Endgame. And then Endgame was like just okay, you know. I think the big difference between this and last year's card is last year you had the blow off to Siori versus Utami, you had the blow off to um, Say versus Tam. Those are two big multi-month feuds that are being blown off. Here it doesn't feel like there's any story to any of the matches aside from Suri and Julia. There's no yeah, story and- whatsoever. I mean, Kyrie and Utami was set up because Utami chugged a beer. That's a great, I, t- I will disagree with you. That's a great way to set up a match. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, I don't deny it. I do not deny it, but that's, that's the build. That, that is the build. Awesome as it is to see Utami absolutely <laughs> pound a beer and definitely do it quicker than I would be able to. That, that's the build. And that's, that's, that's where I think this card falls down. And that, I presume, is also the issue with running 23 pay-per-views in a year. You are going to start burning out your storylines. So that's something they are going to have to think about because it has left us with a card at the end of the year, which we've all been sort of building to, that is okay on paper. It, it, it's good, but it should be blow away. Um yeah. In terms of New Blood 6, that card was also announced, and that is as follows. Uh, Sanai Taka Bayashi from Best Body Japan versus Rina. Uh, Miyu Amasaki versus Moran from Diana. Um, Nene Takahashi is working New Blood 6, which is bizarre. Um, (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, quite literally the opposite of New Blood, but fair play to her. She's working Lady C in a passion injection match. I'm not entirely sure what that is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Dan Nakano and Waka Sugiyama are taking on Mike Ozaki and Ram K. Chow. Um, we've got six woman tag with Hanan, Momo, and Sairida taking on Mirai, Nanami, and Tomoka and Nava. Um, Starlight Kid and Karma, which of course is Haruka Umasaki's um, alter ego, are taking on Mei Sakurai and Tekla in the semi main. And then in your main event for the future of Stardom title, you have got Amisori versus Ruaka. Um, before I quickly go through the year end climax card, Matt, what are your thoughts on, if any, on this new blood card? It looks pretty solid. I believe it's probably streamed live on YouTube. And I'm excited to see Lady C and Nanai Takahashi because, again, 
she gave a lot of stuff to a lot of competitors during the uh, the five star. And we've seen Lady C really upping her game, especially in the strike. So I'm excited to see the chop forearm big boot fest between the two. I mean, you say he's going to air for free on YouTube. Knowing our luck, it'll be a bloody pay per view. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, thanks to Scotty Wrestling, who announced the year end climax card, because I can't actually find it on the Stardom website. So I am going purely off Scott here. Um, oh, he might be working you, dude. He might be <laughs> <imagine>. working here. <laughs> he says this. Roman Saki Reigns Kashima. is on here. Yeah, Saki Kashima <laughs> for the red belt. Um, <laughs> Hannon versus Momo Kogo versus Wakasugiyama versus Rina. Um, Meltia versus Seven Up in a non-title match. I know, oh. I know, I know. Wait, 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 wait! wait, wait. They're doing Meltia yep. versus Seven Up five days before. Yep. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, presumably so that Nene Takahashi can get a win there and then take the loss at the pay per view. But I say squash them both into an, into <laughs> in a week. <laughs> Have Meltia go over in total eight minutes. <laughs> Um, we've also got um, Awadatai versus Prominence, the Awadatai team of Momosaki, uh, Tora Ruaka, and Fukikin Death. We've then got a couple of Road to Wrestling Dream Queendom matches where we have got um, Saya Kamatani and Azumi versus Starlight Kid and Haruka Umasaki. That's going to be very, very good. Um, and then we have got a 10 woman tag elimination match with Julia Micah, Himika Tekla, and Mei Sakurai taking on Suri Mirai, Amisori Naba, and Nanami. Um, we've also got Stars and Queen's Quest, just realized, underneath as well. Um, I'm I'm a fan of the two main events. I do not understand the point of running Meltia versus 7-Up a week before you're running it on pay-per-view. But, I mean, I don't understand much of what's gone on recently. So, <laughs> um, what are your opinions on that, Matt? Yeah, I'm... Kind of trying to take it all in because I had no idea what that card was, but uh, it seems like a what's what's the date of that show? Is it the twenty fourth? It Christmas is the Eve, twenty fourth of December, Christmas Eve at Corican. Oh, look at that! Oh, that was my next question. Where's the venue at Corican Hall? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just doing. I mean, Corican Hall is kind of like a legendary venue, and a venue they've been selling out quite a bit this year. Maybe they're just giving you that preview of the uh, Seven Up versus Meltier to to sell some tickets would be kind of my guess. And I hope they do. And I'm sure it'll be a great match, but yeah, still kind of scratching my head. But all in all, it looks like it's a pretty solid card. Now, is that a pay-per-view? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't last year and hasn't been like ever. So fingers crossed, no, but quite possibly. Um, I mean, you've got Melty versus Seven. Or would it kill them just to add another person to each team? Like just make it a six woman tag. You still have the, um, and then put Waka in there. Yeah, obviously yeah Waka absolutely. Eat the there you go. There yeah. you go. You've got Tropical Passion Mask as part of Neo Star Army. Get Jazzy Gaber yeah. in. Yeah, there you go. Anybody. Bring back Alpha Female. We like her. Yeah. All right, we haven't seen her in a while. What the heck? Yeah, just stick her in. Um, so, with all that negativity out there now, let's end on a positive before we go into what we're going to talk about next week because there's actually a little bit of downtime in terms of stardom believe it or not um let's talk about our award so matt correct me if i'm wrong but we are going top three singles wrestlers of the tournament top three teams of the tournament and top three matches is that correct if that's what you want to do, sir. I did. You never clarified if you want to do three or five. So I did five. If you only want to do three, that is fine with me. Look at that. I rhyme. So we will do top three if that's what you want to do, sir. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Why not? Let's before, do top three. We're, uh, okay, we're going to end this on real positive. Before we get in here, I'm going to end it on something positive. Because or I'm going to say something positive, and then we'll uh, we'll swing into this. So obviously we had our patreon um tournament where the winner of whoever guessed the finals right will get a t-shirt from our website now again because i was away i did not get a chance to look at anything in the patreon i sent a message over to sean uh, who basically runs all of that so i don't know i'm almost positive nobody had seven up versus aphrodite in the finals <laughs> uh, if i'm wrong amazed. please let me know yeah i will be amazed however which which would usually mean nobody wins Somebody's going to get a prize, folks. It's the stardom cast. It's Christmas. Your Uncle Matt Turner loves you. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to kind of just go through every everything just to see who was the closest. 
on the finals and then you know the, the tiebreaker so there will be a winner announced just bear with me like i said i just got back from my trip <laughs> all of about about 18 hours ago and i still had to go into work today another story for another day so just give me a little <laughs> bit of time hopefully in the next week or so i will be announcing the winner there will be a winner i will be shipping out a shirt from our uh, our website out to somebody so just bear with me anywho yes rob I, let me tag you back in go ahead let's uh let's get to these are our, our top three of everything and if you do fancy buying some uh, stardom cast merch from uh for christmas then uh, you can find it on our website and there's a link in the podcast description um what a guy singles wrestlers then matt list me your top three singles wrestlers of this tournament number three was the Nai takahashi okay number two number two was tomoka inaba and number one, Saya Kamatani. We have a same number one. Um, wow. Singles wrestlers. So number two will surprise you, I'm sure. Um, number three, Tomoka Inabe. Number two, you. And number one, Saya Kamatani. It has to oh, be. We had, th- yeah, look at that. We had three, uh, we, we, two out of the three with yeah. our number ones being the same. And uh, I am going to give a special shout out to Hazuki because she's awesome and uh, never yeah. fails to put on absolutely fantastic matches. Um, Real quick, Tekla, Tekla. What Tekla, a return. Yes. What a return. I had my number. She was my number four. Um, Let's go teams then. So I'll go first if you don't mind. Um, Absolutely, sir. So special mentions before I do anything, BMI 2000 and Mafia Bella. Um, and then my top three, number three, FWC. Number two, Meltia. Number one, Aphrodite. Number three, FWC. <laughs> <laughs> number t- Your number two is Meltier. They were my number four. Number two, Micah and Himika. Okay. And my number one, my number one was uh, My Fair Lady. No, it was, it was Aphrodite. <laughs> Aphrodite. Just because of the continuity in their relationship. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, let's go then. Final thing before we sign off, because we know we've uh, we've taken up over two hours of your time. Um, matches. What were your top three matches of this tournament, Matt? Number three was Meltier versus Black Desire from the 13th show. Uh, mm-hmm. Number two was from the final night, Mihimi versus FWC. And number one was from the final night, the finals with Seven Up and Aphrodite. You're not going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Go I've, got, ahead. I've got the exact same matches. Just get out of here with third and second switched. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the exact same matches man the exact same matches um but anyway thank you so much for listening guys we really do appreciate it we'd love to hear what your favorite matches of this tournament were let's try and make it a bit positive hey eh? because uh i know there's a lot of negativity and to be fair rightly so about some of their booking decisions late the uh, new blood show as well um in the meantime you can find us anywhere you get your podcasts we're getting loads of reviews on spotify and on apple podcasts as well thank you so much to those people that are taking the time out to do that if you can leave us a review on um, apple podcasts it massively helps us out we'd really 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 appreciate it it's christmas guys come on um you can also check out the website www.thestardomcast.com I am currently in the process of just updating the lineages of the goddesses and the artist of stardom belts. But other than that, everything is done and up and in working order. So go and check that out. You can find us on all social medias at the stardom cast. You can, of course, find me on Twitter at, at real Rob Goodwin. Matt, plug your socials. Where can they find you, my friend? And finally sign us off. Yes, if you guys need to get a hold of me, any questions, comments, just let me know. Matt Turner OF on Instagram and or the Twitter. If social media is not your thing and you want to fire me over an email, please do. The stardomcast22 at gmail.com 
And I cannot say thank you for all the fantastic support that we receive literally on a daily basis. And I greatly appreciate all of the members of the Patreon and anybody that has liked or shared any of our things that myself or one Mr. Rob Goodwin has done. We greatly appreciate it because like I always say, folks, it's just not my podcast. It's our podcast because we're all in this together and everybody's different. Everybody's special. 